not just why are they using a substance or why they are obsessed with pornography or gambling, but what is that doing for them? What is that giving them that they need? What peace of mind, what temporary relief? I think a lot about what my North Star is, what I want in my own life, what sort of my ideal life looks like. And then when I'm working with other people and trying to help them, I think about, you know, what what is the North Star that somebody who's really in trouble, I would advise, hey, adopt this as your North Star. Mm. Do you have something like that, that you think that people ought to strive for, for their own sake? The reason I smirk when you ask that question is because um, it puts me in a position of some kind of expert. Um, whereas, believe me, every day, I still work at figuring myself out and finding my direction and, and or, or, or refinding my direction and so on. So it's not like I can say, here's this pearl of wisdom, take it and run with it. And this will, you know, it's just not like that for me. Um, um, well, look, let me turn the question on just for a moment and, 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 and as a way for me to think about your question. Sure. Um, so, like, I, I don't know a lot about you, you know, but <clears throat> what I do understand is that in significant ways, you've made a tremendous success in your life. Uh, a lot of, uh, you know, achieved things that a lot of people look at, my God, if I only had that, I'd be okay. But let me just ask you this, I'm just absolutely curious. Having achieved all that in the material world, did you come to saying to yourself, oh, I'm okay now. The quest no, is over. Definitely not. So and what So, so what were you looking for? So my North Star in the beginning was wealth. And okay. that was, I showed up every day trying to get rich. And at about eight years into that, I was absolutely devastated. Spiritually is probably the right way to think about it. I just felt dead inside. And... Yeah. I, at that point I was worth about $2 million on paper. So my actual life was not yeah. the life of a wealthy person, but um, I had equity in the company and I went to my wife and I said, Hey, I know that I promised I would make you rich one day. I'm going to need to take a step back for a minute because I am profoundly unhappy. Yeah. And she was like, Hey, what I want for is your happiness. And so do whatever you need to. And so we were going to um, move to a tiny village in Greece. And mm. I was going to go back to writing, which was my first love okay. and just do things that made me feel alive. Long story short, um, my then business partners said, Hey, don't leave. Um, we actually feel the same way. So why don't we build something that would give us what we're looking for? Mm. And so if I had to shorthand what I came to realize I'm looking for, which is very much my North star is fulfillment. And I'll define fulfillment as working really hard to build a set of skills that I care about that serve not only me, but other people. And in doing that, I am addressing what I think are the physics of being human. Now, I may be misunderstanding that it is the physics only of humans in this era. I'm very open to this is within the context of the civilization that I grew up in. Here are the things that seem to come pre-built into our hard wiring um, and, and maybe not um, historically accurate. But given the world that I live in, um, doing something, working really hard is a big part of, um, I feel there's just a subroutine in my brain that wants me to earn things. And when I do that, I feel good. When I work hard in the gym, I feel good. When I take a cold shower, I feel good. When I, um, you know, do something difficult for my wife, I feel good about that. And I definitely enjoy that loop. And then... Well, well let, me, uh, let me interrupt, okay? Yeah, uh, please. So if I could find one word to summarize what you, what I think I heard you say, it's meaning. Definitely. Yeah, so, so that, that's one of those human expectations is meaning, I think. That's a need. Okay, now, how you find that is a very individual thing. But let me ask you a very scary question, though, because it, it puzzles me. Um, you identify meaning with hard work. 
Well, I've seen this happen, by the way. Not God willing, it won't. But what if you had a stroke tomorrow? Or some idiot plowed into you when you were bicycling and, 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 and you, you became quadriplegic. Now you couldn't work hard anymore. Then who I be? love that question. Uh, I so obsess they, about things like that. So I've thought a lot about that one in particular. Okay. Um, so I would give myself 30 days to mourn, whether I should or shouldn't. Uh, yeah. I would, and I would be very, I would allow myself to wallow in the sense that it was unfair and that now I have to change um, the things that I engage in that bring me joy. But then at the end of that, it, it is what it is. And so getting lost in unfairness is not going to serve me. So then I would immediately turn my attention to finding a way to have meaning and purpose. I think that that nothing that I've ever experienced in life leads me to believe that I would ever feel fulfilled without meaning and purpose. Okay, great. So, so finding a way to tap into that. And then I have a, a sort of safety valve, which is my wife and I remind each other of this all the time because we've already had all the financial success. At this point, to do something for the sake of money would be so crazy. So we definitely don't do that. And what we remind each other of is you should love your life, like just from a joy perspective. And if you don't check in with, is this joyful? Because if you're working hard and it's joyful, that makes sense to me. Yeah. If you're working hard and it's deteriorating yeah. your joy, your sense of self, whatever, then that's just madness. So for even for our employees, what we say is, look, you're an adult. I want you to control when you need a day off. So you have an unlimited vacation policy, use it as you see fit. Um, I do want people that are hard workers, don't get me wrong, yeah. but I know there are some times where on a Tuesday, I'm just like, I'm, I'm burning out. Like this isn't fun. And so I stop immediately because I know what my priorities are in life and joy is extraordinarily high and it is certainly higher than success. Okay. Well, that's great. Um, that makes it easier for me to answer your question. Um, in terms of my new star, um, Joy is something that um, for me is an ongoing project, you know, and I really do think that goes back to the lack of play that I received in the first year or two of my life, you know, under conditions of wartime and genocide, there's just not a lot of cheerful play that happens with a baby. Um, but what really lights my fire is truth. I just want to know the truth, whatever that is. And because you like knowing how the world works? There's no because. You see, it, 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 truth is its own value. I don't. I mean, I could, I could give you all kinds of good reasons why truth is a good thing, but ultimately, uh, it's just a value in itself for its own sake. And so, I'm passionate about truth, um, both internal truth and external truth, and I'm passionate that my work is to, as much as I can perceive truth and as much as I can communicate my perceptions, that other people have access to truth as well, or that, they, or that their own passion in, in truth is kindled uh, in, in its own right. So that's, that's my, if you ask for a North Star, that's what I would say for myself. It's really interesting. Not at all what I thought you were going to say. Can mm. I interpret when I look at the books you've written and I look at, you know, your willingness to come and do a podcast like this, can I read that all as an exploration of truth or are these sort of side tangents? No, purely that's what it's about. It just so happens that as a medical doctor, somebody who dealt with depression and ADHD and myself, um, dealt with terminal illness and palliative care, dealt with addictions, deal with babies um my path to truth has been through my own experience and through my medical experience my personal experience what i've been through as a person what i'm going through as a person and what i saw experienced and learned as a physician so the books express all that uh, when it comes to physical illness or addictions or child development or whatever 
but the, the lodestar is always the truth. And from that point of view, I never cared much who agrees with me and who doesn't, and to what extent my colleagues value or don't value it. You know, that's just as I see it, folks. You know, and uh, um, in this society, and I, this is not a personal lament; it's a, just a general comment that. Um, Truth is not hard to come by, not easy to come by, because uh, for all the knowledge that's out there and for all the expertise, um, it's also split and it's also disintegrated. So people have a hard time seeing the overall reality of things. And so my attempt always is to look at the context and look at the overall reality. So not just how do you, how do you change a kid's behavior, but why is the kid behaving that behaving that way? And what is it in, in the environment that the kid is reacting to? Or somebody who's addicted, not just why are they using a substance or why they are obsessed with pornography or gambling, but what is that doing for them? What is that giving them that they need? What peace of mind? What temporary relief? What numbing, numbing of painful emotions? And where did those painful emotions come from and what happened to them? And what's the context in which it happened? So that everything leads back to everything else. And uh, so I'm always looking for the larger truth of things, which demands a broader look, not isolating everything, but looking at everything as, as one, which scientifically and spiritually and materially it is. I am obsessed with what is true. So I resonate with you there big time. What I don't understand, and so I'm gonna ask you a follow-up question to see if I can isolate um, yeah. what it is about the, the nature of truth just in and of itself that is meaningful to you. So um, I'm interested in the truth for one reason and one reason only if I'm really honest with myself, and that is it has so much utility. Once you understand, it's like, it's like physics to me because we understand physics, we can send things to the moon. We can create satellites, you know, better manufacturing, whatever. Um, would the truth be as meaningful to you if you were trapped on a desert Island with access to all the information in the world, but you could never engage with another human. So you could assimilate the truth. You could, learn what it is, synthesize it, maybe even have insights that other people are missing and, and know to the core of your being that you have uncovered something that is true. Would that be meaningful or is part of what makes it matter to you that you can put it back out into the world and that ultimately somebody can use it? Well, so first of all, let's not confuse truth with information. Oh, interesting. Because so help me understand what I'm missing. Well, there's lots of facts out there, but truth is much larger than facts. It's 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 integrating the facts in a in a in a picture of of reality. So that, and I'm I'm maybe putting very clumsy language on what may be a far more beautiful sentiment. Um, so when I, when I hear you say that, and I take it in totality of how all these things come together, I come back to this idea of the truth is that is the way the world works. So don't ask about the, the addiction, ask about what caused the pain. Yeah. Like that makes sense to me because now you can actually address it and heal. But what makes that capital T truth interesting is the healing for me. But, but, and so I, but why, why do you want people to heal? Um, because of my North star. So my North star, which seems self-evident to me, and I'm always surprised that it isn't everybody's North star is that there is, uh, the only thing that matters to me in the way that I view the world is your neurochemical state and your neurochemistry. The only thing that's resilient because joy comes and goes, suffering comes and goes, hopefully. And, the only thing that gives you the resilience to even in the middle of a, a painful moment, a storm to have emotional equilibrium is what I call fulfillment. So again, meaning and purpose derived from working hard for something um, 
that you have developed a unique set of skills. So you really matter in that situation. And it, it isn't only alleviating your suffering, it's helping other people. And that to me feels so inherent to the human animal that as a social species, we're just never going to be able to escape getting psychologically punished for failing to help others. And we're never going to escape getting rewarded for helping others. And I think that the more uniquely we can do that, so in a way that matters to me, right? So you're not still a high school teacher. You're, you're expressing helping others in, in a very unique way that, I mean, literally I've never come across anybody that's got the unique um, conflagration of things that you have. So that makes your contributions all the more individual and therefore I would imagine precious to you. So anyway, because of my North Star, I want to alleviate that pain by having worked hard to offer something to somebody that they go, whoa, like this alleviated my pain. And now I can also go do something that helps other people. Um, well, so exactly. that's why the healing matters. Okay. So look, so then to go back to your desert island question, the Buddha put himself in a desert island, you know, I mean, metaphorically speaking, isolated in the forest, didn't see anybody, you know, he, no, I'm not talking about me, I'm talking about him, the way I understand that historical figure, he would have been perfectly okay being on his own because he attained a sense of reality that was complete. And then he made a decision out of compassion to come back and teach others. And you are talking about compassion as well. You're talking about not truth as utility, you're talking about truth as compassion. So it's not just useful because you can build things with it. The way you defined it is you want the truth so you can alleviate the suffering of others. And that's part of the truth. And like Jesus said, you know, he another great spiritual avatar and teacher, he says, you will know the truth and the truth will liberate you. He didn't say the truth will liberate you. He said, you will know the truth and it will liberate you. So when you know the truth, that's where freedom is. So truth goes way beyond facts. Truth ultimately, as I understand it and as I've been taught, has to do with liberation and freedom. And it has to do with compassion uh, in exactly the way you talked about it as well. So when you say, tell me what truth is, well, I'm telling you, it's got all these aspects. And it goes back to our conversation about meaning. So that life without truth is not a meaningful life. That is, uh, that's very interesting. As you were talking, I was like, oh, please, God, let him write a book about truth. I would... Uh, hearing you say all that, I would definitely sign up for that book. I want to talk about the idea of a bodhisattva. So this is one of the things that I found super interesting about Buddhism. Uh, and again, hey, a guy that understands it at 30,000 feet does not know the specifics, but um, that idea of, hey, there's two things you can do with enlightenment. You can, hey, you're enlightened and, and now you sort of stand apart from everybody else, or you get enlightened and decide to be a bodhisattva to re-engage, to go back in, to help other people. And do you think, uh, this is maybe a dangerous question, but do you think any buddy would like knowing what you know about the human mind, would anybody ever that attained enlightenment actually just go peace? I'm out. It seems like the very nature of that moment would sort of, propel you back to other people? Well, first of all, the last thing I could, I want to present myself as, as any kind of an expert on Buddhism. I thought that might be your response. Yeah, you know. But yeah, I mean, there have been, in the Christian tradition, there were saints that went to the desert and they just stayed there. And then certainly on the, all, the, all the Hindu traditions, there are all these people uh, in the Buddhist tradition as well. I think there are people who, um, you know, sit in caves and they just contemplate reality. That's what they do. Um, 
which doesn't mean that what they do has no impact on others. But they're not going out. But they're not out there trying to recruit others or to teach others. They're just doing what they're doing. I have extraordinary difficulty imagining myself being one of those people, um, which I'm not sure is either is is an advantage for me. I mean, I might be more advanced if I could handle the idea of being on my own and and not doing anything and just being and just valuing being, period. I imagine that for a person like me might be a step forward. But I, but yeah, I think from my limited understanding, there have people, there have been people who've done that and they're part of the human spectrum, aren't they? Very well said. Gabor, what, at this point, you're 77? Yeah. You're so productive. What is it that keeps you going? When most people are like counting the days until they can retire at 64 or whatever, um, <laughs> what, what keeps you going? Uh, Botox, steroid injections. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, well, look, I mean, you talked about meaning. Uh, there's so much meaning in my life. I am, I'm so fortunate, you know, that, that, and I've never stopped developing, not that I've arrived there, but I've never stopped developing. Like I've never stopped being curious. Um, I believe I have, a, I've finally come to accept that, yeah, I do have a contribution to make and, 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 uh, and that, that has value in the world and it is value for me. So, at, at this point, it's just, it's not keeps me going. It's, it's, it's like, it's just who I am at this point, you know, is, is, is I'm curious about what I'm doing. I'm excited about much of what I do. I'm excited about having conversations like this. I'm excited about the book I'm writing, the teaching that I do. I'm excited about spending time with my wife of 51 years now. I'm excited about I can still go swimming and bicycling and do the yoga and, and just, you know, my life is just a very blessed one at this point. Not that I feel like that every moment, but since you ask, it's not like I'm, you know what it is? When people talk about work, what is work? I, I think um, if I remember right from physics, one way to look at work is energy expended against resistance. And the more energy ex you expend against more resistance, the harder you have to work, but the more fatiguing it is. But I'm fortunate enough and I'm free enough in my life right now that I don't have to face resistance, internal resistance. I want to do what I'm doing and I, there's just so much more. And, and, um, and I'm sure that my vision of reality is still very limited and maybe there's more to find out. In fact, I'm sure there's more to find out. So it's just, uh, it's just an expansion into old age, I think, if, if we're fortunate enough. We'll see how that goes. And, you know, one never knows what tonight will bring, let alone mm -hmm. the day after tomorrow might bring. But so far, it's an expansion, not physically, because as we get older, physically, I don't fa swim as fast as I used to, but but there's an expansion that's available to us mentally and spiritually, relationally, in terms of understanding, and that's I don't know if that's I don't know what that sounds like, but that's what keeps me going. How how do we expand spiritually? And that's probably a word that would warrant definition but I'm curious how you think about that. Well, so spirituality is really beyond who we are as bodies and as minds. So it, it's an awareness that lies underneath all that and can hold all that, but isn't identical with it. 
And this is where it's hard for me to say, am I saying anything I truly know? Or am I just repeating what spiritual teachers that I've respected and have learned from have mouth and I'm just repeating what they told me? But it's both, I think. I, I do have a sense that there's more to us and that more is, I think, what we call spirituality. And, and it's all kinds of shapes and forms and I'm not concerned about that. But I do know that um, I am not who I used to think I was and that nobody is who they think they are. Um, they're, they're beyond that. And I, that's the common teachings, I think, of all spiritual traditions, which I'm very inadequate. And, I, and this is not false modesty, I'm just telling you. Uh, it's, it's, I'm inadequate at translating because I haven't had that deep experience that other people have had. The truth is hitting your career goals is not easy. You have to be willing to go the extra mile to stand out and do hard things better than anybody else. But there are 10 steps I wanna take you through that will 100X your efficiency so you can crush your goals and get back more time into your day. You'll not only get control of your time, you'll learn how to use that momentum to take on your next big goal. To help you do this, I've created a list of the 10 most impactful things that any high achiever needs to dominate. And you can download it for free by clicking the link in today's description. All right, my friend, back to today's episode. It's, it's very interesting. And I believe you that you're not just being um, falsely humble, but as somebody who um, works so much with, there's two, two parts of your background that um, probably lean into what I would consider spiritual. Uh, but I think we may define that slightly differently, but um, mm -hmm. one is the palliative care, which I'm extraordinarily fascinated by people that do that. Um, and then y your, I don't know if you would call yourself a guide of, um, of hallucinogenic transformation. I'm not sure exactly what your involvement is with that, but I know that you've, um, you've explored it enough to, to sort of have at least a, a sideways glance at what's going on there. Um, talk to me first about palliative care. I know that you sort of ended up there by accident, but what makes that fascinating to me is you've got uh, subtracting out the pain. You've got somebody who's there themselves, but all of a sudden their future is a known quantity and it's very short. And yeah. the profound change that that makes in the human mind, I find interesting. Um, what did you learn about life, about yourself um, in your time in palliative care? Well, the the people, the nurses and the physicians and the, um, the social workers and, and, and the others who work in palliative care tend to be a very special breed um, in that they're not afraid of death. Um, so learning not to be afraid of human death and giving up your sense of omnipotence uh, are very liberating. By a sense of omnipotence, I mean, physicians are trained to save lives. I'm telling you, Tom, I knew physicians that would barely visit their patients in palliative care because they couldn't stand what they considered to be their own failure, which of course it wasn't. But the, 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 their self-image as healers or as physician, curers just couldn't withstand the white heath of death. And so that's very liberating when you just, you get to talk to somebody and you get to minister to them and you're not pretending to be able to do anything more than you can do. But you can really listen to people and get to know people in their final days and their final hours, final weeks. It's an absolute privilege. Um, what what about it is a privilege? Is is there an insight? Getting to know, getting to know, getting to know people without pretension. You're not pretending to do anything you can't do, and they're past pretending. 
if they want to die right, they pass pretending. Mm, that's interesting. What do you mean die right? Well, there's ways of dying. You can you can resist it. You can resent it. You can be angry about it. Or you can uh, actually accept it and allow so much of what may be repressed in life to finally arise for yourself. Because, it, because before then you were too busy and you were too intent on your role and your personality and getting this done or getting that done. You know, in one of my books, when the body says no, I, I talk about this guy who, um, who had a company selling shark cartilage as a treatment for cancer. That was total shock, but he believed in it. And then he developed cancer himself. And he was admitted to the valley of care unit and I was looking after him. And he was still eating, he had terminal cancer all over his body, he had a week or two left. He was still eating shark cartilage, which smelled awful. You could, when you stepped off the elevator to the pillar carefully, you could smell the shark cartilage. And I finally said to him, well, what does that smell? I don't like the smell, what does it taste like? He said, it tastes awful, I hate it. I said, why are you eating it? And he said, do you think it'll help your cancer? He said, no, I no longer believe that. But my business partner would be so disappointed if I stopped eating it. And so one of the last things I was able to do for him is to, say, is to actually convince him and to help him see that, look, you don't have to pretend anything anymore. It's not your job whether or not your business partner is disappointed. He had to literally walk into the last week of his life before he could let go of his role as being responsible for other people. So that coming towards death experience can be a powerful teacher for people. And I've seen real love and real beauty and uh, real inspiration from a lot of these people. So it's beautiful work. And I, I know that everybody who works in palliative care will tell you the same thing. It's a real privilege. Can you share some of the beauty? Well, I think I just did. <laughs> just people being the, be, allowing themselves to be touched, to be helped, um, to be honest with themselves. Um, to share stuff that they maybe never told anybody else before in their lives because they're too afraid to. Um, to accept real lessons in acceptance. You talked earlier about how you, you might use of a month to resent and so on, you know. So these people are very often not past that point. Well, that's a privilege to witness. Knowing how resentful I can get when life doesn't go my way, you know. Are there things that, um, would it be a valuable exercise for people to run the thought experiment of, you know, look, I might not make it to tonight, like you said, let alone tomorrow. Um, do you think that there is uh, insight to be had from that? Or is there another way for us to access um, getting beyond, like if, if you're defining beauty as, Hey, you don't have to pretend anymore. You don't have to play a role. Um, you can really be who you are. And maybe this dips into big T truth. Um, how do we access that now without needing to be truly facing a terminal illness? Well, again, I don't know that I have. It's very easy for me to speak from a present position as a, as a healthy, active 77 year old. And I know what I like. I know what it gets like when I get a stubbed toe and how <laughs> my life is unfair. You know, why, why did I stop my toe? No, I can't get on my elliptical machine, you know. So again, I'm in no position to give you stage advice, but I can tell you two things. One is I've talked to a young fellow in his 30s. He's written a book called Blessed with a Brain Tumor. His name is Will Pye. And this guy's a brain tumor. And I said, well, what's the blessing here? I interviewed him. He said, well, for one thing, when I'm interacting with somebody now, 
I value each moment because I never know that this might be the last time I ever speak to them. Um, and the Buddha, again, I, I'm talking like some kind of Buddhist, which I'm not, but um, he had his monks do a meditation where they had to imagine themselves dead in the, in, in, in the graveyard and they had to imagine themselves being eaten by worms till the flesh melts off their bones. It's rotting flesh. And then they had to imagine themselves as bones just lying there, disarticulated bones, and finally even the bones being ground into dust, you know. I can't say that I've attained any of that. I mean, I'm just telling you, there are practices. There are practices. There's a book on my shelf by Stephen Jenkinson, who's another fascinating guy. It's called Die Wise. And he said, you know, it's basically about, you want to die well? Start preparing it for it now. What's the wisdom, if you remember from the book? <clears throat> the wisdom is that I haven't read the book yet. My, <clears throat> my son just gave it to me um, as a birthday gift a few weeks ago, so I'll read it, but I haven't read it yet. That's really interesting. Um, yeah, I, for me, it has been a very useful thought experiment to remind myself that for a long time, I focused entirely on, um, I'm, I want to live forever. And I was um, really trying to uh, do all the things that I thought would extend my life to say 120 years, believing that in that period of time, you know, that science would get better. And we sort of hit health escape velocity where every year that I lived, there was, you know, a year and a day added to um, our ability to cure illness. And that really served me for a long time. And it allowed me to make long range plans that other people not, might not be willing to make and really made me feel excited and connected. And then there was something about probably about a year ago that I started to have this feeling that I would be better served and more motivated by flipping it and to start now thinking about how transient my life is and that almost certainly since none of us know what's going to happen um, almost certainly I am going to die and I don't get a heaviness from that um, quite the contrary there's something about it that I find very motivating that I do see the beauty that people so often talk about that you know you have this life for such a limited time and to waste it playing a role, to waste it doing things that don't fill you with joy, to waste it chasing somebody else's dream, like it just doesn't make sense. And yeah. that, that has been fun. And I, I enjoyed both sides of the coin. I got something very beautiful out of each. And it, I didn't even like consciously make the shift. I just found myself more and more sort of getting a bigger gust of wind, of, of elevating wind, if you will. Uh, from the mm -hmm. side of thinking, man, this really is like, how lucky, how transient, how beautiful in its sort of ephemeral nature, how wonderful it is. Um, and mm -hmm. I think part of that, part of what was releasing in that for me is I am very much driven to matter, but never at the cost of joy, right? So it's like, I really want to matter. I want to do things that like are going to be felt, but I don't think about legacy. I don't think about living beyond myself or doing things that need to outlive me. Um, I just think about like, hey, what can I do right now that will bring me more fulfillment, that will give me more joy? And yeah, it was very, it was very fascinating to see that transition happen where I went from the only thing that gave me that push was thinking of myself living forever. And then all of a sudden realizing, no, it's actually now more advantageous to think of sort of imminent death, which trust me, I'm not in any way, shape or form eager for. If we are imperfect, and do you agree with, uh, I think it was um, Solzhenitsyn who said that the evil runs through, or the line between good and evil runs through the heart of every man, which rings true to me. Does that ring true to you? I would say that the potential for both runs through every person. Hitler was a human being. As I say this in the book. Jesus was a human being. At least, let's agree that in his earthly manifestation, whether you're a Christian, he, he was a human being. Um, even Jesus was tempted, wasn't he? You know, he's in the desert and he's tempted by power and ego and uh, acquisition. Um, the Buddha, 
in the Buddha story, he's tempted by lust and by greed and by aggression and egotism. Mm. So yes, the potential for, for, for that kind of egotistical self-regard, which turns out to be evil at its ultimate expression, is, is that, that strain is in us. So is the strain for compassion like the Buddha, infinite love like Jesus, humility like Moses. That's all within us as well. The question is, which conditions promote which mm -hmm. in his development? The Buddhist talks about seeds, of which seeds in our minds are planted and which get watered and which don't. So, yes, I agree that the potentials are there. And in an embryo, everything is there. But the question is what gets nourished and what gets suppressed. And I'm saying that in this society, it's the worst of us that gets nourished and the best of us that gets suppressed. All right, so let's define those. What uh, I would assume that loving attachment, unconditionally loving yeah. attachment, certainly towards your children, yeah. that's part of the best of us. Yeah. What are some other attributes of the best? And then we'll move on to some of the worst. So let's talk about children and then let's talk about people in general. So uh, children's needs are uh, unconditional loving acceptance, from everyone or just their parents? Well, their parents, or well, ideally from the community, but certainly they're, they're nurturing caregivers, whoever they are, and they're meant to be more than just a parent, by the way. We're never meant to be parented in nuclear families. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's pure, that's a modern thing. So unconditional loving acceptance, rest from having to work to make their relationship work. Say that again? Rest from having to work to make their relationship work. In other words, the child should not have to be mold themselves into anything to make their relationship work with their parents. They shouldn't have to work. They shouldn't have to be good, nice, pretty to make their relationship work. They shouldn't have to take care of the parents' emotional needs to make their relationship work. Like people that have to work to, make their, to meet their parents' emotional needs end up in deep trouble as adults, mm. very often physically ill. You go into tremendous detail in the book about yeah. that. So, children uh, should be able to allow to feel all their emotions. And I mentioned play before. Those are the needs of the child. As human beings more generally, we need a sense of connection, a sense of meaning, a sense of belonging, a sense of transcendence so that there's something, we're part of something greater than just our legal egoic concerns. These are all the needs of human beings. To the extent that they're met, we thrive, to the extent that they're not met, we shrivel. And there's lots of shriveled people in positions of great power in this society. No doubt. Okay, so what are, what are the, as we're creating this soil that we're going to nurture things in, yeah. how do things start to go awry and how do we begin to prep the soil for something better? Well. We've covered that to some degree, so things will begin to go awry when we lose contact with our pending instincts, and we and we. Is it just that? Like, is this? Would you, um, uh, speaking from experience, the book yeah. is very broad. But if you were going to really like bring it down, is this largely an echo of a parenting system that has become dysfunctional? It, it's a society that's become humanly dysfunctional that transmits its expectations <laughs> through the parents. And that actually begins before birth. Because already the, the more stressed and troubled the parents are, that has a physiological impact on the child's brain development. So I'm, I'm just talking pure science here. So mothers who are stressed and depressed, their infants in the womb are already getting those messages hormonally and through uh, nerve conduction and so on, so that you can actually um, monitor the heart rates of mothers who are stressed, and those heart rates will be different than the heart rates of, of infants whose mothers are not stressed. In the book, you talk about the, uh, the crazy ice storm yeah. that ends up showing up in the epigenetic markers of kids. If you don't mind, walk us through that. It's pretty crazy. Well, it, it's only that um, in, in the laboratory they've shown that <clears throat> the more you stress um, parent animals, the more troubled and stressed the kids will be. So in Quebec, there was an ice storm some years ago, and the 
and the parents underwent great, the mothers underwent great stress. And, you know, there was, it was really cold, there was no heating, a lot of stuff wasn't working. Um, those mothers who experienced that stress, their children were shown to have more troubles later on, behaviorally and learning wise and in, and, and in other ways as well. So again, the stresses of the parent translate into the physiology of the child. There's, <coughs> a, there's a study that I quoted in the book about, they looked at um, marriages that were stressed and you could, <laughs> there's two ways you could tell how stressed the, the marriage was. One is you could ask the parents and they, could, they would talk about it. Mm -hmm. The other way is you could, marry, you could measure the s urinary stress hormone levels of their children. Wow. And the parental conflict was reflected in elevated stress hormone levels in the urine of the children. Now, elevated stress hormone levels in the urine means that the immune system itself is under assault. Mm -hmm. And that has an implication for health later on. Uh, we know, for example, that the more stressed parents are, the greater the risk of asthma for their children. And that the degree of stress on the parents is correlated with the amount of medication the kid will need for their asthma. Um, uh, amongst other studies, lots of such studies. Mm -hmm. So in other words, there's a correlation between the emotional environment that we grew up in and our physiology. Yeah, I mean, that's really the core thrust of the book is, mm. hey, all these things that you think are maybe just old age or yeah. um, bad diet, they're actually related to trauma or even disease. In fact, one of the ones you talk about that was the most eye opening was ALS, yeah. which, you know, I would think of as a genetic disease, bummer, horrible roll of the dice. But walk people through the the um, there is a predictable personality trait of people with ALS that I was like, what? Well, so um, first of all, there's nothing genetic about ALS. Nobody's ever shown, uh, I mean, there might be some rare examples of ALS genetically induced, but those would be a tiny, infinitely small minority. So genes don't have much to do with most chronic illnesses. There are some illnesses that are genetic. There's the one that runs in my family. My mother and my aunt had it, muscular dystrophy. Gradually, they became weaker and weaker. Already when I was a child, my mother couldn't lift her arm up. And uh, in the end, she was not mobile at all. And so if you get that gene, you're going to get the disease. But those diseases are very, very rare, about one in 10,000. Most chronic illnesses have very little or no genetic basis to it. Mm -hmm. So, for example, there's a breast cancer gene, but out of 100 women with breast cancer, only seven will have the gene. And out of 100 women with the gene, not all of them will get the cancer. Mm. So in many cases, even if these genes are implicated, it's the, inf it's the interaction of genes and environment. Now in ALS, it's the, you know, the, the ALS personality, which I noticed in palliative care when I was a palliative care physician, also in the literature, are people that repress their healthy anger and are emotionally very rigid and they don't ask for help from anybody. Um, and usually that's based on childhood trauma. And uh, Lou Gehrig was like that. The Can you define trauma? In you, you go to very careful lengths in the yeah. book to make sure that people understand trauma yeah. isn't always getting hit with a bat or yeah. uh, being sexually abused. Like there's a range that can be wildly impactful. Well, let's take uh, Lou Gehrig, after whom the, name, the, the disease is named in North America. His father was an alcoholic, and Lou Gehrig uh, was one of these really nice guys that took care of his mother emotionally. He had to. That's what happens in the home of an alcoholic. Very often the child becomes the caregiver. Now, he was such a nice guy that, you know, he, the, 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 the record that he set for uh, consecutive games played that stood for so many, many, many decades. Why did he set that record? Because even if he was sick, he would play because he's too dutiful to his teammates to take himself out of a game. Mm. Is that a healthy thing or not? It's not healthy. On the other hand, when there was a young rookie on the, on the Yankees who got sick and he couldn't play, and the manager was very upset with this kid, Gary says, what are you talking about? He's sick, he can't play. Took the rookie to his own home where he lived with his mother. His mother put the kid to bed, 
the rookie, nursed him, and Lou Gehrig slept on the couch. So that kind of self-sacrificing, self-negating, emotionally repressed, really nice person is the person which is typical of the ALS personality. And there's been a whole lot of studies on that that show that you know these are the people that get ALS. It's just that the doctors don't make the link between that personality pattern and the ALS. They so just basically think, swallowing your anger. Swallowing your healthy is anger. Direct. Yeah, sorry. Swallowing your healthy yeah, anger yeah. is directly causative is, to ALS. I think it's a major contributor. You never see it. You never see it, and you never see the healthy anger in anybody with ALS. And you always see this hyper conscientious, hyper autonomous self sufficiency that no, I don't need any help. Mm. No. And when you talk to neurologists, which has been done in studies, they always describe their patients as extraordinarily nice. ALS patients, extraordinarily nice. Why are they so nice? Because they, re they repress their healthy aggression. It's just that the neurologists don't make the link between that and the disease. I'm saying that that plays a major role because that repression of emotions, again, the emotions are not separable from our physiology. The nervous system and the immune system and hormonal apparatus and the gut and the heart, they're all one system. When something happens in one area, something happens in the other area as well. Look, the analogy in the book is this. Think of a person with a big beach ball, trying to push a beach ball under the water. That takes a lot of effort. Now, have you ever been angry? Of course. Okay, now, when you're angry, it's not just an emotional state in your head, it's a your whole body is. Mm. Now, how much energy would it take to suppress that energy, to suppress that anger? Can you imagine? Yes. So that you don't even feel it? But not feeling your anger was an adaptation to your childhood, where the anger wasn't permitted. So th that emotional, physiological effort of repressing anger takes a toll on the nervous system and on the immune system. It's a major role in disease. I'm saying, yeah, it pays a major contribution. Mm. Yeah, this is where the book really starts to get into some fascinating territory as you go through all these different diseases and you start talking about, okay, repressing anger. Uh, you go into the, God, is it the natural killer T cells yeah, end up yeah. uh, being suppressed yeah. because you're putting so much energy away from your immune system. Your immune system can't keep up. And so there's all kinds of things like cancer that are afflicted. There was one thing where you said like back in the 1800s or early 1900s, there was a doctor that was like, oh, whenever you see somebody with heart disease, they have this type of personality. Yeah, yeah. And you even talk about in the book, the type C, you said it's not a personality type, but that there are traits yeah. that people with type C have yeah. that end up being sort of pro disease personality traits. Yeah. What are some of those traits? Well, before I answer Sorry. that, let me go back to something. Let's talk about healthy anger for a minute, if you could, mm. okay? Um, then I'll illustrate these traits, okay? What is healthy anger? Why are we given healthy anger? So there's a, there's a system in our brain for anger. Not just for us, mammals. What is it there for? It's there to protect our boundaries. Somebody that invades your space, physically, or in the case of human beings emotionally, used to say, no, stay out. That's the role of healthy anger. Now, if I repress that healthy anger, what would happen to, you, to me in life? People would be just trespassing all over me all the time because I had no boundaries. So healthy anger is a boundary defense. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Okay. Healthy anger is a boundary defense. It just says, seems like one of its uses, I'll be honest. I don't know that I'd say it's its only use, but I don't know if it matters. Healthy anger, that's its only use. That's its major use. Just boundary protection. That's its major use. That's why it came along. Animals have it. You're in my space. Ah! Get How out. far are you extending that to loved ones? So now if you encroach upon a loved one. Well, if your loved one in, in, intrudes your space emotionally. No, I mean, if somebody else is intruding on my loved one. Oh, yeah, that too. Yeah, yeah. Way. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's you or your loved ones, anything you cherish. Absolutely, for sure. 
So that's healthy anger. So the role of anger is to set a boundary between what's nourishing, uh, you know, to, to, to let in. The lot of healthy anger is to keep out what's dangerous and unwelcome, right? What's the role of the emotional system in general? Is to let in what's healthy and nurturing and to keep out what's dangerous and unwelcome. Is that fair enough? Seems good. What's the role of the immune system? Same, basically. Exactly, it's the same. The role of the immune system is to keep what was dangerous and toxic, allowing what's nourishing and healthy. The immune system and the, and the emotional system are not separate systems. They're part and parcel of the same apparatus. They're unified. When you suppress the emotions, you're also suppressing the immune system. When you set, when you, when you, when you don't know how to defend your emotional boundaries, that also um, weakens your immune boundaries physiologically. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. Or if you repress the anger, that anger doesn't go away, doesn't evaporate into the heavens. It turns against you in the form of depression or self-loathing and so on. In the same way, the immune system turns against you, and now you have autoimmune disease. And so the traits that were identified with chronic illness, most chronic illness, like cancers or immune disease, are emotional self-suppression, inability to experience healthy anger, desire to please others, to fit in, to be acceptable, to be nice, um, to be ignoring of your own needs. These are the traits that are over and over and again identified in the literature, whether with multiple sclerosis or rheumatoid arthritis or with cancer. Now, these are, not the real per these are not the real person. These are adaptive traits in response to the childhood environment, but they take a heavy toll. Or take another so-called illness, and by the way, the case I'm making is that what we call illness is actually response to life. So take, a, take depression this so-called biological disease of the brain. What does it mean to depress something? Try to push it down. To push it down. What gets pushed in, what's get pushed on in depression? Well, I can tell you, I've been depressed. What gets pushed on depression is your natural emotions. Everything is flat and nothing matters. Nothing has any meaning. And that yeah. starts with people pushing them down? That's that's the word. That's what the word means. <laughs> it means to push it down. It starts in childhood with pe people having to push down their emotions. Why do they have to push down their emotions to fit in with other people's expectations? So, and I don't know the literature on this at all. So, there oftentimes then the depression will just sort of creep in slowly. I always assumed it was tied to something being stuck in. Um, a bad relationship, a death in the family, loss of a job, that there would be some sort of triggering event. Well, the, okay, fair enough. If you're in a bad relationship, the healthy response is not depression, but to deal with the challenges in the, in the relationship, either by working them out or by leaving the relationship. Depression is not a necessary outcome. The response to the death of a close one, of a close one is not depression, it's grief. Grief is the healthy response. We have a system in our brain for grief, by the way. So grief becomes depression when you're not allowing yourself to grieve. But you don't know how to grieve properly, yeah. And you don't allow how to grieve properly because your emotions were suppressed as a child. And um, so, yeah, we have uh, these healthy systems, but they get, their activity gets deformed through our natural expectations. Okay, so to stay with depression for a minute, so you're pushing all this stuff down. It yeah. starts in early childhood. You're trying yeah. to fit in. You yeah. want unconditional love. You're not getting it, so you have this directive for attachment, and so you begin to, oh, I see what I can do. If I, if I don't yell, scream, if I'm not expressing frustration, yeah. if I'm the caretaker or whatever that situation demands, then all is well. So now I've learned this adaptive response to suppress my emotions, and over time, it begins to numb me, I would assume. I have yeah. not been depressed, so, okay. but, uh, so you're beginning to be numbed, but now something, it gets, starts to be very extreme. And yeah. you, what I have heard depression explained as is just like 
the skies are permanently gray. You will yeah. never see joy again. Yeah. And so yeah. what what is breaking in that, that like the beach ball analogy I like, right? I'm pushing something under the water, but if I stop pushing, it will pop back up. And exactly. so if that thing or my emotions is when you're treating depression, let's say non-pharmacologically, is it the release of the pressure on those emotions to let them finally come up? Yeah, so the, so the, the difference between the pushing the beach ball down is that I'm doing it consciously and deliberately. Mm. But the repression of emotions that a child um, engages in is not conscious, is not deliberate. It's an automatic response, it's unconscious. Therefore, the can't, child can't just let go like that. And then as you say, it numbs and, and, and becomes overall a depression. Now the, by the way, I'm not against pharmacological treatment. I've taken antidepressants, they have helped me. So I'm not here to advocate against them. Mm. I, I could talk about their misuse, but in principle, sometimes they're helpful and occasionally they're life-saving. And much of the time, they're over-prescribed for way too long and we're not dealing with the real issues because the pharmacology deals with the symptom but it doesn't deal with the underlying problem. So yes, the healing of depression, and I talk, you know, the last, the, the, the final part and the longest part of the book really is on healing, is you have to reconnect to yourself so you can feel your emotions. That's the treatment of depression. Talk to me about reconnecting. How do you reconnect? What is that process? Well, uh, first of all, you recognize that you're disconnected. And you notice how that disconnect shows up in, a, in so many areas of your life. Uh, in your, on the job or in, the, uh, in your personal relationships, for example, or in your relationship to yourself. So you have to become aware. And this is where I talk about disease, whether it's physical or so-called mental, um, as teacher. Not that I recommend illness as a way of learning to anybody. It's, it's not my but preferred. But if it happens. But if it happens, it can actually teach you. Hmm. And you can ask yourself, what have you been pushing down? And what are the stories? Why do I push it down? Oh, I pushed on my emotions because I've learned, I have the belief that if I'm angry, I'm a bad person. Well, is that really true? Is a person that experiences anger really a bad person? Um, I learned that if I push down my needs, uh, then people will love me. Do I really, be, do I really be lo want to be loved at the expense of disconnecting from myself? As a child, I had no choice because I had to be loved or connected with, otherwise I wouldn't have survived. Is it still like that? So basically it's a gradual... Isn't it though? Sorry? Isn't it like, isn't in fact, this is my overarching question and as somebody yeah. that has helped so many people through therapy, you probably yeah. have the answer or an insight, but as we become adults, yeah, you don't have like other than your parents, should yeah. you be lucky enough that they're still alive, but man, out in the outside world, pe people do want you to act a certain way and if you don't, they're not gonna be around you. Like, I'll just be honest. If somebody's throwing a tantrum as an adult, I don't have time for that. But an adult doesn't throw a tantrum. But Are you I mean, sure? Yeah. Like the, the, I have seen adults throw what no, I would call the adult version You've of the tantrum. You've seen adult, you have children in adult bodies throw tantrums. Interesting. Okay, yeah. go on. You know, so the, ad, the adult who throws a tantrum, he's a traumatized child who has not developed self-regulation. I'm not talking about repression of self, but regulation. So for example. Help me differentiate. So, so for example, I throw up at the airline counter and uh, they've um, overbooked the airplane, okay? My healthy response is disappointment and some degree of anger. I'd say, this is not right that you did this. I want you to redress it. You do something about it, please. Throwing a tantrum, yelling at the poor clerk behind the counter who had nothing to do with creating the problem, who's just trying to do her job and trying to help me as best she can, is that that's not a mature adult. That's a child whose mid cortex or self-regulation has gone offline and his emotional circuits have taken over. Believe me, I've been an adult child very often in my life, as my wife could tell, me, tell you. So uh, that's not an adult. 
Okay, so then the process there goes back to connect to yourself, figure out why you're repressing this. Yeah. Let go of those things that are keeping it down. Find a way to um, be able to regulate yourself so that they're sort of contextually yeah. uh, sensical so that we're not in unhealthy anger territory. Um, okay, interesting. So trauma is, um, is an imprint that makes you react to the present like you're still a child, essentially. I mean, that's a very narrow definition of trauma, mm -hmm. but that's one of its essential aspects. And that the important thing that you said earlier is it's automatic. It's automatic, it's unwilled, it's automatic. And it's, um, and actually, when you look at the brain scans of deeply traumatized people, the prefrontal cortex is totally asleep. And the emotional circuits, you know, they're, the, the 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 primitive emotional responses are active. This is why so many of so much of the jail population are traumatized people. That's why they end up in jail. But instead of dealing with their trauma and helping them develop, which they could, under the right circumstances, become adult people, self-regulated. The jails just make it worse mm. by the way, the, by the way they torment people and the way they traumatize people even further. So, when I talk about a trauma-informed society, informed society, what if we actually understood trauma? What if we just actually understood it? It would have huge implications for medical school, for medical uh, health delivery. What if when you went to the doctor with your depression, you weren't just told you got this biological disease of the brain? Here's a pill. But they actually said, what happened to you as a child? One of the people I quote in the book is the great uh, pediatrician, psychiatrist, neuroscientist, uh, Bruce Perry, who just wrote a book with Oprah, the title of which is called, What Happened to You? Mm. Not what's wrong with you, what <laughs> happened to you? What if we asked that question? You know, so that would change medical treatment completely. What if in, in, the, in, the, in the prison system or in the legal system, we didn't just say, what did you do? But what happened to you that made you do it? Now that wouldn't mean that we allow or encourage antisocial behavior, but it would mean that we would actually want to rehab rehabilitate people and to help them become who they could be. You know, that's a very different legal concept. What if in education, it was kids' developmental needs that were put paramount rather than their performance. It's interesting. How would you do that functionally? What would school look like? Well, I talk about it a bit. Like schools in, in Finland, there's much more play. There's much more freedom. And they have much better results than we do. So that, we, in other words, we honor... What the, are the right results to look at? A child who's curious, who wants to learn, who's engaged, who's... Um, respectful of others, um, who is confident, um, that would be the right results. Then you don't have to worry about stuffing knowledge down their throats. Why? Because they want to learn. They want to learn. And so you don't have to punish them, you don't have to reward them. You just present them with the opportunities to learn, and they will. That's a natural human attribute. We kill that in this society. As people, we always think we're looking at a reality and our view of it sees reality the way it is. But it's been a spiritual teaching for eons that really, well, the Buddha said it. The, the, the very first statement in the collection of his saying, the Dhammapada, is that our thoughts are in the lead. And so, so whatever our thoughts tell us, that's the reality that we see. So essentially, with our minds, we create the world. No, you... Johnny, Ka Johnny Cash and Istang says, it's all in your mind. Um, one foot on Jacob's ladder, which is the stairway to heaven, which, by the way, wasn't originated with Led Zeppelin. The stairway to heaven is actually from the Bible, uh, where, where Jacob dreams that the angels are going up to heaven. Or one foot in the fire. So Cash thinks one, uh, one foot on the ladder, one foot in the fire, it all goes done in your mind. So the the kind of thoughts and beliefs that we have create the world that we live in. And that's what I get from that song. Now, what the song doesn't say is that before with our minds, we create the world, the world creates our minds. 
So this is where development comes in, that, that given our early experiences, we create a view of the world and of ourselves and of other people that then governs how we are in the world and how we feel about everything. But we forget those early experiences and those shaping influences, and as a result, we mistake our view of the world for the world itself. It all goes down in your mind, which is what Johnny sings. What's the, what's the time period of that profound shaping window of development? Is it um, just a couple of years in the beginning? Is it till we're 15, till the brain stops developing at 25? Like what, what does that window look like? It begins in the years. Um, so already the stresses or the experiences of the mother um, shape how the infant experiences the world. Uh, we know this so that we can talk about it maybe later in detail if you wish, but there's lots of evidence now that the child's brain is actually in his development is significantly influenced by the mother's emotional states. So it goes back that far. And so of getting into the, and, what and, I really and, want to understand is the, the foundation of, of that. So I've heard you talk before about in um, native societies, it was always understood that if somebody was angry, you would just keep them away from a pregnant person because yeah. you didn't want that anger transferring. But my question is, why not? What, what is it about um, intense emotions or negative emotions? What is it doing to the substructures of the brain that then make that disadvantageous as the child grows? Well, so there was a study done after 9-11. Um, women who suffered post-traumatic stress disorder while they were pregnant as a result of 9-11. A year later, their offspring still had abnormal stress hormone levels. So fundamentally what happens is, is that the brain's capacity to perceive stress and to process it gets impaired. So that means people are now more prone to feel stress when there's no real threat. Or they may be more prone not to recognize the threat when it is there. So our whole perception of the world uh, and safety and our responses to stress, the physiological apparatus for handling stress is affected in already by what happens in the womb. So thinking about um, the gym, for instance. So you go to the gym and you want right. a stressor, you want a certain level of difficulty in order to, in that case, you're tearing the muscle slightly and then as it heals, it grows back stronger. Yeah. Is it that the brain reacts differently to stress in that any amount of stress is bad or is there a certain amount that is um, useful and just we're going too far? Well, this is where I think language becomes very important. Uh, well, how, what we mean by we use the word stress. So if you, if you mean by stress, the challenge, life is full of challenges, which will get your adrenaline going and so on. That's a good thing. When I talk about stress, I talk about a threat that the organism doesn't know how to respond to. And it's too much. And so that the, um, the, uh, the person who actually coined the word stress, who was a fellow Hungarian Canadian, Hans Selye, uh, he's the, word, word, the, word, the one who coined the word in his present usage. Um, he really meant pressure on an organism that's too much for the organism to handle. So that's what I mean by stress. I don't, I don't mean the stress of a freely chosen challenge such as going to the gym and, and working your muscles hard and, and, and going even beyond what you could do before. I don't mean that. I, that's not what I mean by stress. Um, I mean by stress. And, and, and the, the biggest triggers for stress, according to the research, are loss of control, uncertainty, lack of information, and conflict. So when you subject people to those circumstances, which in this society happens a lot, people are stressed often beyond their capacity to deal with it. Now that capacity is very much programmed by what happened to us very early in life. And where does that, so it begins in utero, where is the sort of closing of that hyper malleability phase? Because where, where, one thing that really drives me is the question of, okay, damage has been done, um, you know, like in, 
your case where you're born two months after, or excuse me, two months before the Nazis invade Hungary, it's like mm -hmm. not a lot to be done about that. That is what it is. So now the question becomes, can we undo it? Uh, is there a window of hyper malleability where the, you could sort of reprogram the infant or is it like almost like an imprinting machine where it's like, nope, you had this heavy amount of stress in utero, that's imprinted. And no matter what you do in the first three years is never going to undo that. It is imprinted uh, in many ways, biologically, which we could talk about that the person is not even aware of imprinted in how their genes are turned on and off, imprinted on how their chromosomes function, imprinted on how their stress apparatus responds to the external environment, um, imprinted in their cells, imprinted in inflammation in their bodies, and so on and so on. And the earlier it happens, and the more it happens, and the more temperamentally sensitive the child, the greater the effects. Having said that, it's never not reversible. It's never not approachable. Now, fact is people can heal, people can um, rewire themselves, people can um, uh, find a equilibrium, but the more happened earlier and the earlier it happened, the more difficult that work becomes, which brings me <laughs> to my um, epitaph that I've designed for my gravestone. You know what it's gonna say? It's I'm gonna say, now. It's going to say it was a lot more work than I had anticipated, you know? <laughs> it, that it's, is it, a fair it, assessment. It's, I'm, it's ongoing work. Look, I'm 77. It's ongoing work. And, you know, um, when I don't take care of myself emotionally, when I don't do my yoga, when I don't get myself into the swimming pool or on the exercise bike, um, when I take on too much in my life, it gets activated. So... Yes, it can be dealt with and it can be healed and it can be uh, regulated, but it takes consciousness, it takes awareness. Given your perspective with having dealt with a lot of people that have had severe early traumas um, that have echoed through their adult lives in the form of addiction, um, what is it, if it's identifiable, what is it that makes some people able to get in there, do the work, harder you know, than expected though it is, and other people that get stuck? Yeah, well, that's the important question. Um, first of all, let me just say that trauma shows up in multiple ways. Addiction is only one of them. So-called mental illnesses, depression, anxiety, ADHD, PTSD, whatever others. Um, physical illnesses, chronic physical illness like uh, cancer and, and autoimmune disease very often reflect trauma. And in physiological ways, which we can talk about, and I'm not just giving you a personal opinion. I'm telling you what the research shows. So trauma has multiple manifestations of which addiction is only one. Now, what makes the difference? Uh, I don't think there's one single factor, but there are a number. Uh, first of all, has there been anybody along the way that was empathetic and supportive to you? If there was, that can make it, no matter what happened, that can make a huge difference. Um, earlier in your life, the better, but if there was a teacher, if there was a f uh, uncle, an aunt, anybody who, who maybe couldn't change your situation, but could listen to you uh, or just validate you or speak to you empathetically, that can make a difference. Um, social class, has a lot to do with it because um, if you can afford to see a therapist and talk to somebody, that puts you at an advantage. How much stress you continue to be under in your life, that has a lot to do with it. When people are trying to just to survive, it's hard for them to consider transformation. So people that are under economic pressure or racially oppressed or, or um, uh, under uh, economic threat, um, political conflict. These make it difficult for people because people are just in survival mode. Uh, people that are highly sensitive, they're both at an advantage and at a disadvantage. They're at a disadvantage in that the more sensitive they are, 
the more it hurts when stuff happens. But also the more sensitive they are, the more likely they might have to have some insight or awareness or some creative outlet. So it, that can work both ways. I would say the biggest difference is, was there some empathetic support in your life at any time? And, and even if you talk to people who've been addiction for a long time and you say, well, what made the difference? Somebody talked to me like a human being. Somebody didn't judge me. They accepted me. Um, what what window does that open up for them? Is it uh, it begins to allow themselves to stop judging themselves and to develop self awareness, or is there something else at play? No, it's, it's the very first thing you said. Um, anybody who's traumatized, and by trauma I mean a broad range of experiences from abuse, extreme things on one hand to just parents who are too stressed to pay attention to you or to really see you and receive you. When children are not seen for who they are or when they hurt, they can make two assumptions. One, there's something wrong with the world and my parents are not capable or they don't love me. Or, can make the, or, or they can make the assumption, and that's why this is happening. Because I deserve to be loved, and I deserve to be treated well, but these people are incapable, and they don't care. You can make that assumption. You can make the assumption, I'm talking about unconscious assumption. Or you can make the assumption, there's something wrong with me. Those are the two choices. Now, it's much safer for the child to assume that there's something wrong with them. Why Otherwise, do you say that's it's safer? Be, it's a lot safer, yeah. Why is safer? It, why is it safer? Because what, what's it like to live with the danger as a four-year-old living in a world where your parents are dysfunctional and they are uh, perhaps hateful towards you? How could you endure that for one minute? That's you know, so you have to make the opposite assumption. If this stuff is happening to me, it's because I deserve it. Something wrong with me. Now, go back to your question. Somebody comes along and, and treats you compassionately. Oh, maybe I'm not that bad person. Here's a person who's, here's somebody who's treating me like I was a worthwhile human being. Maybe I'm a worthwhile human being. So that compassion, that reflection that you get from this other human being subverts your image of yourself as worthless. And that's what makes the big difference. Who? So that points to something that is really interesting, maybe a little bit scary. Um, so Lisa Feldman Barrett, who you may or may not know, uh, has really interesting thoughts. So I'm always trying to figure out how much of who we are as nature, how much of us is nurture. And she told me, Tom, look, you're, you're asking the wrong question. So the reality is we have a nature that requires nurture. And as you talk about this, it, and I'm, I'm going to put words in your mouth. Tell me if they're accurate. It sounds like you're saying our minds are essentially co-created and we are presenting ourselves and looking for an echo back of, or a reflection back of what people think about what they see. And we're using both of those things, our own sort of sense of who we are, plus what's being reflected back to us to figure out who we are. So if something negative is reflected back, that's actually going to shape my sense of self. And if something positive is reflected back, that's going to shape my sense of self. Now, that to me begs a question. I'm so curious to know what you think about this. So my response to that is, cool, I I'm going to become totally self-sufficient. I'm going to get to the point where I don't need somebody's reflection back but I can feel the danger in that. It seems like a risky game to say, I'm gonna totally withdraw, I'm gonna do all the work internally, I'm gonna make sure that I know who I am, that I don't need that reflection back. Um, but knowing how important loving relationships are and things like that, I can feel while there would be some upside to totally knowing who you are, believing in yourself, but you're also walling yourself off. Um, how do you conceptualize handling that? Well, it's a question of who's doing it and why. Because you can do that walling off in two ways. So the Buddha, if you know the story, he, he goes through all these teachers and he wants to get enlightened and he goes through all these very rigorous, self-denying 
aesthetic practices and he just doesn't the truth doesn't come to him and finally he goes off by himself and he sits under a tree by himself and he just sits there and he meditates and he contemplates everything that arises in his mind and then after a while he has his nirvana he has this um enlightenment experience And then he's got a decision to make. He, he understands his own nature. He understands the nature of reality. And he really does. He's one of the outstanding minds in history. But then he's got a decision to make. So do I just revel in this spiritual liberation that I have worked so hard to attain? And no, he decides he's going to go back and teach other people because he wants to be connected to humanity. And he wants to enlighten other people as well. What, can so, you articulate what his um, sort of breakthrough enlightenment realization was? Well, um, it, it'd be presumptuous of me to do so because I've not had that realization myself. I've only read about it or I've seen other people talk about it. Um, I don't mind a regurgitation of what other people have said. I actually, so I know Buddhism at a 30,000 foot view. So yeah. I actually don't know other than life is suffering. Um, mm. I don't know what sort of the key revelations are. Yeah, life is suffering is, I mean, I, I, his real teaching is that life doesn't need to be suffering. But the way we set it up with our minds, it is suffering. So it really has to do with goes back to the Johnny Cash song. It all goes on in your mind. You disidentify from your mind. And reality is much greater and much deeper and much more sacred than your mind will ever tell you. That's interesting. Can you say that another way? Even, even I don't know if, if this is your own understanding of life or um, a reflection of Buddhism, but I'm curious to know if life is more profound than your mind, what are the elements that make it profound? Is it beauty? Is it love? Is it, what is it? The problem with the conversation, Tom, is that there's two minds talking about the nature of reality. And uh, in that we don't use the same words or? No, no, no. no it's that we're, we're still in the mind. Whereas um, my, very modest understanding of the spiritual teachings, not just Buddhist spiritual teaching, but Sufi teachings or Jewish spiritual teaching, Christian spiritual teaching. I'm talking about the spiritual teachings, not the religion. Mm. Um, is that there is essence, there's truth that goes beyond what the mind itself can uh, comprehend. So far, but we must have access to it in some way, even if only through pure experience. Otherwise, well, it would be. But it is. But that's the whole point. It is pure, pure experience that a great poet like Rumi can write about, or Hafiz can write about. But um, I cannot claim to have had that pure experience. Or if I did, I didn't recognize it as such. Can I give you one of the experiences I've heard you talk about? And I'll be curious to know if, if you were grazing along the edges uh, of something. I believe it was your first experience with ayahuasca. You said yeah. that um, you were there and suddenly had this rush of just pure love. And that you, if I remember right, you started crying and, and you were just overwhelmed with the sense of just, just love in its purest form. And yeah. in, in that moment realized you had, close yourself off to that experience is when I think about people talking about there being something more profound, those are the only sort of moments that I can relate to where I think that feeling is so elevated and wonderful that, but that's the only thing I've ever touched on in my own life where um, yeah. that seems like what they could be talking about. Uh, does that, is that getting close? Well, it's, it's, it's heading in the right direction. Um, I think that real spiritual teachers would say that that way their experience there wasn't a feeling. It was, feelings are like uh, activities of our nervous systems. And they would say there's something deeper than the nervous system. So what I experienced was a state. 
of of being uh, manifesting in love. And the love might not be the only manifestation of it. It might be courage, clarity, um, compassion, um, uh, justice, um, strength, will. I know one spiritual teacher specifically who talks about it in those terms, but these are not feelings. The feeling of love and the state of love are not necessarily the same thing. But yeah, there's more to it than just the mental experience. There's the direct, the, the, the mental thought um, or even the emotional resonance. It's, it's more like a direct experience of something. And, um, you know, it's clear that what the Buddha had was, for one, he wasn't the only one, uh, was a direct experience. But to go back to your question about isolation, so there's a way of isolating yourself as a way of committing yourself to re enlightenment, which doesn't mean that you'll stay away from other people for the rest of your life. It just means that you're going to go deep into yourself and not be distracted by all that the world throws at you. Then there's another way to isolate yourself, which is a defensive one, which is the world is so awful and heck with them all. I don't need anybody. That will protect you from some kinds of hurt. Because if you withdraw from relationships, you'll never be betrayed. Well, that's true. On the other hand, that itself is a state of pain. That isolation itself is a state of pain. So when you talk about isolation, it depends who's doing it and where is it coming from. And, and to go back to the original question, and you mentioned um, nurture, nature, it's perfectly true that we're born with certain expectations for the world. I mean, every creature is like our, our lungs are an expectation for oxygen. If it wasn't for oxygen, we wouldn't have lungs. So we evolved in response to the availability of oxygen. Otherwise, we would not have evolved the way we did. There might be some kind of creatures around, but it wouldn't be us. So our lungs are an expectation for, for, for oxygen. In the same way, our nervous systems are an expectation for love, for nurturing, for being held, for being valued, for being enjoyed. That's what the infant is born with those expectations. And whether we develop well or whether we don't depends very much on how fully those expectations are met. Now, we can survive without them. My God, many of us have. But survival and fully being alive and fully living are not the same thing. And fully and, and survival adapting to things. I mean, you can adapt. Human beings are particularly good at adapting to a vast range of environments. But that doesn't mean that we thrive in all those environments. So one of my arguments, one of my points about the culture that we're living in now is that, yeah, we're surviving, but we're hardly thriving. And we're not thriving precisely because our expectations, I'm talking about our built-in natural expectations. I'm not talking about artificial expectations like expect to be wealthy or I expect to be respected by everybody or I expect to be achieving this or achieving that. No, I'm talking about the natural expectations of a human being. And the, the less those expectations are met by the rearing environment in early years, the more distorted we become, because the more we have to adapt to something less than what we need. And, and in my view, as, as I'm sure you're well aware, much, much of disease, physical, mental afflictions, addictions, and so on, they all arise out of the ways we had to adapt to unnatural circumstances where our natural built-in expectations were thwarted. Gabor, that's a really um, useful way to look at things. I like that a lot. So um, I use different words to kind of describe something maybe similar, if not identical, which I call the physics of being human. So there are just some things we have needs, we have um, compulsions, we, for instance, 
there, there is going to be a voice in your head talking to you. There is, I've never met anybody that doesn't have a negative voice in their head talking to them. And we have, we're an active species, right? But we're an active species that also tries to conserve calories. So you get this weird sort of conflict and that insight that you just gave, I find really powerful when I think about early development. So this notion that our brain comes with, um, I like to think of it in a, a biological way, though I'm sure what I'm about to describe will be inaccurate, but that there are essentially neurons in the brain that are looking for that love, the validation, being enjoyed. I, there was something about the way you said that that really hit me. Um, and that our brain is going to, it's, it comes like lungs expecting the air, it comes expecting that love, that validation, that enjoyment and getting all of that reflected back. And you talk a lot about a child being narcissistic. And so that's part of the physics of being human. It just is, everyone is, and not in a negative way, just it's all about me. That's where their brain is at in their development. And right. if we sort of run the experiment of saying, well, that's probably the most advantageous thing, at least from a historical context, that you so got that, it was so prevalent that to think erroneously to think that a parent's happiness means that you're good is such a great way to establish confidence and a sense of worth and you know all these things that are going to propel you forward Gabber, you're really making me put things together that i've, I've never ha been able to draw the lines between um I, I that bet, is amazing I bet, I, bet, I bet you say that to all the guys <laughs> uh <laughs> i say it to all the good ones how about that um <laughs> But it's interesting, especially when you put it in context of your upcoming book, which of course I have not read called The Myth of Normal and how sort of broken our society is. I've always approached it from the, the like, hey, th this society is, is like any society in time where you can have a path through it that is pathological or like the Buddha, you can find a path that is beautiful and profound. Mm -hmm. And you take, I think, a more aggressive approach of saying, no, 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 there's something uniquely disruptive about the era that we're living through and sort of just walking through what you were saying about the, the, ex the brain has expectations of love the way that lungs have expectations of air and there's something about the way that we have structured society that is breaking that and in breaking that, we're dysregulating the immune system and a whole host of other things. That is really interesting. Um, walk me through then some of the specifics that you've covered in Shattered and in some of your articles and talks. How is modern society dysregulating us and what can we do to resolve some of that? Well, first of all, it's very interesting. Uh, you said shattered. I don't have a book called Shattered, but it's called Sorry, scattered. sorry, scattered, scattered. No, no, but what's interesting is how many people may say it that way. That's interesting. That's uh, very, what, yeah, what have I just revealed? Yeah. But yeah, and to me, it's always re revealing something about the person and their self-image, you know, because I, I don't think anybody's ever shattered. Um, scattered has to do with the scattered mind. The American, the Canadian title was Scattered Minds. It had to do with ADHD and you know, the, the dispersal of attention. Um, gosh, you say so many things that I want to engage with, uh, Tom. Let me, let me jump back to what you said about everybody's got this negative voice in their heads. Yeah. Yeah, but that's not a given. It's just what happens in this society. Uh, so the you think there are societies where that would not be present or at least not ever present? I think we haven't had societies like that for a long, 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 long time. But that has to do with what civilization does to human beings. So I'm sure that voice has been there since the beginning of civilization, but not necessarily in our Aboriginal state as hunter-gatherer, uh, small band people. Now, we might have a conscience that keeps us in line, but that's not the same as a voice that keeps telling you how bad you are, how worthless you are. I think that's particularly is a, that itself is a product of life experience. What, what exactly, if you have a sense, causes that, like what in civilization leads to that? Kids not being valued and enjoyed and played with for just who they are. Kids having to live up to expectations in order to meet the approval and welcoming of their parents. Well, if that's the case, they better install a little voice in their heads that'll keep them in line. Otherwise, they won't get loved. 
And it's not a conscious process. Nobody does this, oh, I'm going to instill a little voice in my head. It's not that. It's, it's, this, this is, it's a natural adaptation to an unnatural situation. In this society, and I'm not blaming parents, in this society, it's extraordinarily difficult for parents to give those conditions of what the American psychotherapists Carl Rogers called unconditional positive regard, a, a regard that has no conditions of worth attached to it. I accept you just for who you are, the way you are. That's very difficult for parents to deliver, even with the best of goodwill, because they never had it themselves. Not only that, they endure so much stress. So you mentioned my book, Scattered, which is an ADHD, and I was diagnosed with it at a, you know, in my 50s, and I never bought into the idea that it was a genetic disease, and even less do I buy into it now. But the tuning out that scattered minds that I wrote about, that itself is a coping mechanism. So when, there's, when, a, when an infant is under stress, because the parents are stressed, as I was as a Jewish infant under the Nazis, uh, there's a lot of stress, as you can imagine, for a whole year of my first year of life, and more than that. Of course I tuned out as a way of escaping from the unbearable stress that my mother was under. Because as an infant, you just soak in the stress of your parents. But this was happening when my brain was developing. So that gets programmed into my brain as an adaptation. Now, you don't need world war and you don't need genocide to make an infant stressed. You just need parents who are under economic stress, who've got relationship issues, who got unresolved childhood trauma, who are isolated themselves, who are struggling in their lives, who have depression or anxiety in their lives. And infants, young children, pick up on that. They make it about themselves. It's too much for them. Some of them will tune out to, to deal with it. The tuning out becomes programmed into their brain because that's when the brain develops under the impact of the environment. And then five years later or 10 years later, or in my case, 55 years later, they're diagnosed with the so-called inherited disease, which it wasn't. It was an adaptation. And it began as an adaptation. It becomes a source of a disorder. But that's my whole point, that these early adaptations have their function, but then they're only meant to be temporary. But since they become wired in, you now they create problems later on. And that, I think, is a source of much of illness in our society. Let me ask, what would be a worse or what would be a better scenario, depending on how you want to answer it? Would you rather somebody be um, loved, validated, enjoyed, held, touched up until the age of three, but then after that, they're put into foster care with all of the woes of foster care? Or... Would you rather somebody um, have a very dysregulated initial three years, um, mother is giving the child up for adoption, which basically tells you that the pregnancy was incredibly stressed, um, gives the child away, it spends the first three years in, let's say, an orphanage, but then gets adopted to a truly loving family that wants them, enjoys them, validates them, hugs them, and gives them all those things. Which of those is the more distressing circumstance? Well, I mean, <laughs> I, I find that a tough one, Tom, because what you're setting up is um, two tragedies, and you're asking me to choose the least tragic, and um, I don't know that I know how to do that. I do know, I think my bias would be that if the child had everything for the first three years, they'll probably have some inner resilience to handle what kind of happens later. Although it would be still be a terrible scenario that you outlined. That total dysregulation in the first three years, I think would be very hard to overcome. Um, not impossible. But, you know, it, it's, when you think about it, the scenario of somebody getting all that in the first three years, and then ending up in a horrible situation, totally unlikely. I mean, why, why would that even happen? 
What is up, my friend? Tom Bilyeu here, and I have a big question to ask you. How would you rate your level of personal discipline on a scale of one to 10 if your answer is anything less than a 10? I've got something cool for you. And let me tell you right now, discipline, by its very nature means compelling yourself to do difficult things that are stressful, boring, which is what kills most people, or possibly scary or even painful. Now, here is the thing. Achieving huge goals and stretching to reach your potential requires you to do those challenging, stressful things and to stick with them even when it gets boring, and it will get boring. Building your levels of personal discipline is not easy, but let me tell you, it pays off. In fact, I will tell you, you're never going to achieve anything meaningful unless you develop discipline. All right, I've just released a class from Impact Theory University called how to build ironclad discipline that teaches you the process of building yourself up in this area so that you can push yourself to do the hard things that greatness is going to require of you. All right, click the link on the screen, register for this class right now, and let's get to work. I will see you inside this workshop from Impact Theory University. Until then, my friends, be legendary. Peace out. But, yeah, I mean, I, I, but, 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 I can but, give you but, scenarios, but... But, but... but if your question is designed to... Um, look at the heart of what is the most important developmental period, for sure it's the first three years. From conception till the end of the first three years. Not that it's over then, but th th those are, that's the template. Mm -hmm. That's the template. And if our society just understood that, just give the kids three good years and, 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 and do everything you can get, do everything you can as a society, as a community, to support parents giving those kids those first three years, whatever that takes. We would save so much disease, so much dysfunction, so much crime, so much addiction, so much political conflict for that matter. So that's the importance of that question is, is if, if we only, my friend, the uh, children's troubadour, Rafi, and you probably remember Rafi, he, he created something called the Child Honoring Society, you know, Child Honoring Project. And he just says, well, if this society honored children, what would it look like? Well, guess what? We'd pay attention to the environment. We would um, make sure that parents have the right support, that children are treated well, that parents who need the help get it so that they don't traumatize their children. So that schools, um, instead of focused on turning the gears and, and, and machines in the form of human beings, focused on promoting healthy self-image and healthy self-development and healthy brain development, what if that was the focus of the schools? It wouldn't, take, it wouldn't be more expensive than what we're doing now. It would be less expensive. So, yeah, those first three years are crucial. There's a guy named Jeffrey Canada who introduced me to a concept that I found both intriguing and terrifying, which goes along. It was why I was asking that question. And he was looking at kids that grow up in the inner cities and why they end up doing poorly the rest of their lives and kids that grow up in um, middle income families and why they end up doing better. And he said that he believed it could be boiled down to the number of words a child hears by the age of three and the ratio of positive to negative. Mm. And I thought, oh my God, is it really that simple? And he was basically saying that you're, it's, it comes down to the language centers of the brain developing. And if in that period where those, those parts of the brain are actually being constructed, if you know that the construction is going to be based on the environment and you give it a paltry environment where there's very little language to interact with, then you get an underdeveloped language center of the brain, which ends up holding them back later where communication becomes extraordinarily important in yes. today's environment. Yes. And I just thought, one, that's thrilling news because anybody that encounters that information when they're pregnant or about to become pregnant can do something with it and, and it will have lifelong positive impact. But it's terrifying to think that you catch a kid at age six and it's like, you can do the work and for sure, like you were saying, you can always, like there can be improvement and I would never want people to hear that and just give up. But whoa, the road becomes a lot harder to hoe. Well, I have to say, I don't agree with you. Uh, what was the man's name? Jeffrey Canada. Okay, well, good name. I don't agree with... Um... I mean, it's not that I disagree with what he's saying, but I think there's, there's a deeper layer there. 
Give it to me. Because what develops first, see the language is the, is the left side of the brain, okay? And what actually develops first, if you look at it, is the right side of the brain, which holds the unconscious. And it's that right side of the unconscious template that's most impo more important than, there's lots of people that with beautiful language development, articulate, they're called professors and academics who are emotionally infants. Um, and sometimes the, left, the, the language centers on the left side of the brain can become a refuge from the lack of emotional grounding on the right side of the brain. So no, what actually matters is how those infants are held, how they're sung to, how they're played with. There's a great neuroscientist, unfortunately died untimely a couple of years ago, Yak Pankstep, his name was, and he distinguished a number of brain systems that we share with other animals. They include seeking, so the exploration of the environment. They include lust, obviously, which is sexuality, necessarily. Rage, which is healthy anger to protect your boundaries. Um, caring, so that we care for infants and others. These are brain systems. And uh, what he calls grief and panic, which is what happens when we lose our attachment relationships, so that there should be grief, there should be panic, those are healthy, when, when our attachment relationships are threatened. And there was also play. And all animals play. And infants start playing peekaboo at two months, long before they have language. And play is much more important for the development of the brain than language is. According to a whole why? lot of developmentalists, and Do you have so a, a sense of so, why? so so because it sets the um, your sense of yourself in the world, and so it's not that what this man Canada says about language isn't important. It's just that first there has to be this right brain, emotionally grounded template for all that. And even later on, it's not the language skills we have to help people develop, not that we don't, we do, but we have to work on their sense of themselves and, 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 and essentially rewire the right-sided unconscious brain. So in LA, there's a very famous psychotherapist, psychologist called um, Alan Shore, was not working on what he calls right-sided uh, psychotherapy or right brain psychotherapy with adults who've got all kinds of language skills but who don't have properly developed unconscious because of what happened to them early on in life. Let me quickly read you a list. Um, there's a wonderful um, psychologist at Notre Dame called Darcia Narvez, who, by the way, you might want to talk to sometime. And... Uh, she studied hunter-gatherer societies, mm. which is how we evolved. That was a revolutionary niche. And for millions of years, and for hundreds of thousands of years, and even for until 15,000 years ago, everybody lived in those societies. So that's where we evolved. And he says, what do these people provide to their infants? And she lists them. Soothing perinatal experience. Prompt responsiveness to the, to the needs of the infant. None of this business about letting kids cry it out. Those kids are picked up as soon as they whimper. In fact, they never even put down. Extensive touch and constant physical presence, including touch with movement. So the parents are always walking around holding the kids, the papoose on the back of the parent. Frequent infant-initiated breastfeeding up for up to two to five years. Whoa! with the average weaning age at age four. Now here, yes. in North America, here in North America, we're lucky if women are able to breastfeed their kids for two months. And about 25% of American women have to go back to work after two weeks. But that's an insult to the infant. I'm not blaming the women. It's the economy, it's the society. A, a community of multiple warm, responsive adult caregivers. So the whole tribe is there to hold you and to enjoy you. Um, creative free play in nature with multi-aged playmates. Now, how many kids in our society get anything close to any of that? 
Then we wonder why do kids have so many mental health issues and behavior problems and so on. And then we, do, and then we focus on the behavior problems and we try and correct the behaviors instead of looking at, well, what is this child manifesting through that behavior? You know? So I think we need a lot, we need to look a lot more at not the cognitive developmental stuff, but at the emotional developmental side of things. So that granted, what your friend says about language is very important. That not being granted, we're barking up the wrong tree. Explain to people, when you say the myth of normal, what do you mean? And then after that, we'll get into what a toxic culture is. I mean, a number, two things. We have this idea that what, that what is normal is also healthy and natural. And I'm saying that in this culture, the norm is neither healthy nor is it natural. In fact, the norm, I think, is making us sick. Number one. Number two, we talk about illnesses and, uh, of body and mind as abnormalities. I'm saying that illness in this society, given the conditions, is a normal response to an abnormal circumstance. Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean by the myth of normal. Okay, so the, obviously you go into great detail about this in the book. And I remember at one point stopping and taking the note, like, wait a second, basically everything that we think of, like you're saying, is sort of a normal result of aging or, oh, this is, you know, just some people have this kind of response and it is what it is. It's just natural. Um, it's all coming back to trauma and it's all coming back to childhood trauma and um, a specific idea that we'll get to in a minute. But I want to push a little bit on that idea. So what, why is what we see in terms of things that we would categorize as mental health issues or um, overly stressed lives or all of the myriad things that we think of, like r rheumatoid arthritis, yeah. one of the examples that you yeah. give. How is that an adaptive response? Well, the rheumatoid arthritis is not, a, not an adaptive response in itself. It's the outcome of an adaptive response. So when you talk to people, and I've interviewed many, or you look at the, the research literature on who gets rheumatoid arthritis, it's people who are super conscientious. Um, they have what's called um, hyper-autonomous self-sufficiency. In other words, they don't know how to ask for help. They look after the emotional needs of others rather than caring for their own. Caring for their own. They tend to suppress their healthy anger and uh, they really try to fit in and not make waves. And these people, that's an adaptation. This is how they adapted to their childhood. Mm. They grew up in families where they were not accepted, seen for they were, they might have been traumatized. The adaptation was to make themselves, to suppress their authentic emotions and to try and fit in with other people's expectations and to meet other people's needs. That's the adaptation. But that adaptation puts tremendous stress on the person and that stress causes the illness. So what I'm saying is that the illness is the outcome of an adaptation. Okay, so let's talk about that adaptation. So yeah. I think a lot about the human mind as having directives. There are things that we have been hardwired to do over millions of years of evolution through even, you know, sort of the non-human part of our evolutionary yeah. tree up through where we are now. And so these directives get implanted and it seems like your thesis is largely about the way that as a child we go okay this is what our environment is i don't have a secure attachment style yeah. maybe my parents aren't paying attention to me but what is the directive is the directive to get along is the directive to fit in like what is the core directive that causes this to become pathological the core directive is twofold one is we have to attach we have to belong we have to connect. But the other actor is that we have to do so while maintaining our own autonomy, our own authenticity. Auto means the self. So that means we have to be in touch with our gut feelings and our emotions and to be true to them. And so what we need is relationships in which we can be true to ourselves. That's the directive. Now, as soon as the directive changes by, because of, this is what we're wired for. For example, authenticity, being in touch with the gut feeling, out there in the wild as a hunter-gatherer, how long do you survive if you're not in touch with your gut feelings? Mm. So that's an essential thing. But what if you grew up in a home 
where your honest emotions are not accepted by your parents. Let's say your parents have read Jordan Peters' book, 12 Rules for Life, where he actually says that an angry child should be made to sit by themselves till they come back to normal. Or that parents should be able to hit their kids in order to get them to comply. Now, if a child experiences healthy and normal anger of a two-year-old, but the message he gets that if you're angry, you will not be accepted by us, in fact, you'll be excluded, you'll be given a time off, we won't even be with you until you come back to quote-unquote normal, then the child will adaptively repress their anger so as to maintain their relationship with their parents. So they give up their authenticity for the sake of the attachment. That giving up of the attachment suppresses not just the emotions, but because the emotions are physiologically connected to the immune system. In fact, they're part and parcel of the same apparatus. When you suppress your emotions, you're suppressing your immune system as well. And now you're asking, why are we seeing a rise of autoimmune disease in this society, which we are, and as globalization spreads, we're seeing more autoimmune disease around the world, is because people are more and more having to suppress themselves to fit in with the false expectations of a society. So that's the link. All right, I'm gonna see if I can hold all this in my head because this is one of the, the most interesting core elements of the book is mm. this collision between authenticity and attachment. Yes. Used an incredible analogy that really hit me hard and that's you said the lung is not the response to an expectation of oxygen. The lung is the expectation of oxygen. Like yeah. it, it, it is the manifestation of that. Yeah, if there, was no, if there was no oxygen, we'd have no lungs. Our, our lungs evolved as an expectation for oxygen. Which makes total sense to me. Yeah. And if the, and I'm paraphrasing here, but I think yeah. I'm pretty close, that the human is the expectation of attachment. Absolutely. So that we, we exist only in relation to having that attachment. Well, how long would a baby survive without attachment? It wouldn't. Yeah, so, 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 so the infant is an expectation but not just for physical, physical attachment, but also for emotional attachment of a nurturing and unconditional kind. We're an expectation for that. We're, that's how we evolved as a species. The, the baby gorilla is an expectation to be loved, nurtured, held, and fed, and protected by the uh, mother gorilla. Now, have you ever seen a mother gorilla who ignores their baby's cries. Can you even imagine one? Have you seen a mother cry, a cat, that ignores the, the, the little infant kitten's meow? Infant is an expectation for unconditional acceptance. We tell parents to ignore their baby's crying. We tell parents to separate from their kids if the kids behave in a way that they don't like. We tell parents to deny children's uh, natural need to play out there in nature. So. Human beings are expect we evolved, as you say, as hominins over the last couple of million years, and as a species, the human, you know, the Homo sapiens, we evolved as expectations for certain conditions. The less a society meets those conditions, the more toxic it becomes to the developmental needs and therefore healthy growth of the human being. Okay, so let's walk through that. So yeah. what do you do? Because you talk about needing to set boundaries and you're, you mentioned, look, I'm a parent and at the end of the day I do have yeah. to set boundaries. So how do we set a boundary without, and, and I'll quote, I think it was Plato or Aristotle that said this, the only impossible job is raising children. <laughs> One of the reasons that I did not have kids is because I, uh, my sister and I were raised in the house, the same house, by the same parents, and we reacted very differently to that. Well, first of all, you're not brought up in the same home by the same parents. That's interesting. Why, why do you say that? Because uh, the, the parent that the child experiences is the parent, the way they show up for that particular child. Your parents did not show up the same way for a female child as for a male child. Even if they tried to, they couldn't have, because they're programmed culturally not to. Secondly, you were different ages. Uh, you came along at different stages of their parent relationship to one another or their self and or their relationship to themselves you did not have the same parents you did not grow up in the same house 
Yeah, that's, no, and uh, for that's number one, number insightful. two, you might have different sensibilities. That is for sure. One of you may be temperamentally more or less sensitive than the other. So that means even if your parents could have been the same, which they couldn't have been, but even if they could have been the same to both of you, you would have experienced them differently. Mm. Okay, so knowing that level of complexity, yeah. how, how do you do this well? Like it, it seems, so my mother disciplined me both physically, so I was spanked. And well, discipline, sorry to interrupt, Tom. No, please. Discipline you is one way to put it. Hit you is another way to put it. Yeah. You know? So, uh, which that word doesn't ring weird to me, but mm. I know given your area of expertise that it does for you. And that's what I'm trying to figure out. So how do we set a boundary with, without the child feeling that there are conditions around the love because reading that in your book, the, yeah. and again, I don't have kids, so nobody needs yeah. to panic, but, um, unconditional love to me at an intellectual level anyway, doesn't seem to break just because you're told to sit on the stairs or be isolated. Well, you see the, the love that the child experiences. See, I don't doubt that your mother loved you, but the love that the child experiences is not what the parent feels. It's what the child gets from the parent. Mm. Now, if you're told that if you're angry, you need to be on your own, what message are you getting? You're getting the message that only under certain emotions are you, only when certain emotions are present, are you acceptable to the parent. But the, 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 child, the child will not experience that as love. But that, um, so I will say this, this is purely anecdotal and it's just me yeah. and I don't want to get lost in that. Yeah. But, um, I remember, I, even as a kid, I would say that my mom, I sometimes get very angry at my mom, but I never doubt that she loves me. No, I, I, and you, I, nor should you doubt that she loved you, because she loved you. But that doesn't mean that your experience of love is unconditional. You wouldn't have any idea. You had nothing to compare it to. That's the only love you'd ever known. So how do you set a boundary without breaking the sense okay, of unconditional? Okay, well, look, so that's the question of who's setting the boundary. You see... Let's say a parent with no, a... No, no, but here's what I mean. With children who are naturally, lovingly connected to their parents, how you set a boundary is you say, don't do that. With a parent that the child is not totally unconditionally connected, you have to use more and more force. So when you talk about setting boundaries, yes, you can't let a kid... I live in Vancouver, British Columbia. It's not... Alaska, but we get pretty cold there. We get pretty cold there in the winter time. A one-year-old doesn't get a choice about do I get to go outside naked into the winter in Vancouver? No mm -hmm. choice. It's not a democracy. No, you don't go outside naked. But how I do that? A child who's wanting to attach to the parent warmly will naturally follow the parent's advice. You see, um, your mother hit you. Aboriginal people, uh, uh, hunter-gatherer people, don't hit their kids. When the, when the Caucasians or the Europeans, the Christians, arrived in North America, they were appalled at the parenting practices of the natives because they didn't hit their kids. And yet those kids were far more confident and capable than the Caucasian kids. So that you can set boundaries through just love, through relationship, through example. It doesn't have to involve force and certainly does not have to include physical force. Is there, so that is one of the things that, that doesn't ring true to me. Now, I haven't studied it, so who knows? So maybe this is just because I've grown up in the system where yeah. it's sort of broken already from the jump. But is there anywhere where that experiment is being run today where we could see that? Because kids seem impulsive and their brains aren't developed and they just seem like little messes that need things like, like for instance, a kid that throws a tantrum because you won't let them go outside into yeah. the snow. So, that, so why can't they throw a tantrum? That's, they're, they're expressing their anger. Not, yeah. Let's say. But, 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 but what were you saying before, because I want to go back to it, just before you talked about the tantrum. Oh yeah, kids are impulsive. Um, here's the thing. Um, children want to belong to the parent. They want to connect to the parent. There's a natural um, range of attachment behaviors that the kid will go through under healthy circumstances. One of them, first of all, is they want to be physically near you. They want to be held by you. In fact, Aboriginal people 
carry their kids everywhere they go. Mm. That's what they do. Gorillas carry their kids everywhere they go, spontaneously, number one. Number two, the child wants to emulate you. They want to be like you. That's a natural attachment drive. So if you show up as a loving, nurturing parental figure, the, parent, the kid will naturally want to emulate you and, and copy you. Number three, the child will want to be good for you without any coercion whatsoever. And uh, again, I'm telling you, uh, hunter-gatherer groups have been studied extensively, extensively for how they parent. And as even books are being written now about how, trying to learn the lessons that they teach about how to parent. Why? Because we've lost our parenting instincts. You're talking like an adult without parenting instincts. And uh, that's not a criticism. Uh, I'm just saying that when you're treated like the way you're treated, some ways I was treated, I talk in the book about it. Look, let me just jump back a little bit. It's, this is in the book. I'm two weeks old. I'm still in the hospital with my mother. And she, she writes her diary. My poor little son, my heart breaks for you because you've been crying for the last hour and a half to be fed. Mm. But I don't feed you because I promised the doctor that I will only feed you on schedule. Now what's happening to me? This woman loves me. My mother desperately loved me. I know that in so many ways. But she's not listening to her own parenting instincts. Her heart is breaking, but she's letting me cry by myself because she promised some stupid doctor that she'd only feed me on schedule. What message am I getting? Am I getting the message that I'm being loved? Or is it too weak old that I'm getting the message that my needs don't matter and they don't care about how I feel? Which message am I getting? Yes, she totally loved me, but she wasn't listening to her own parenting instincts. And that is traumatic for the child. And it's confusing, because she loves me, yet she doesn't even feed me when I'm hungry. Well, that's really confusing, and it's traumatizing. And we're telling this to parents all the time in this society. As a physician, I used to tell parents to behave that way. Mm. I regret that, but I did. So what I'm talking about is a culture that has lost contact with the parenting instinct. Or, take the example of, um, do you remember Dr. Spock? Is that, yeah. yeah. So Dr. Spock was the world's parenting expert for decades. And he talked about how you deal with kids, you put them to sleep, you put them to bed, and you walk out quietly, and you close the door, and you don't go back in. Because you don't give in to the tyranny of the infant, mm. he said. The tyranny of the infant. The infant has an attachment drive that says, I need to be held by mommy or daddy. The child is crying to express that attachment need. Because physically, that's how they can attach. It's phys they, they can't emotionally connect as a, as a one month old. They can connect if you hold them, if they see you, if they hear you. What message are you giving to the kid when you don't pick them up when they're crying? That their feelings don't matter, that they don't matter. That's the message you're giving. You may love them, but you're still giving them a very negative message. And so that you may know on some level that your parent loves you because they feed you, they hug you, they whatever. But at the same time, these people that love you are deeply hurting you. That's traumatic. Aboriginal peoples don't do that kind of stuff in, under normal circumstances. They just don't do it. Do they have a rite of passage moment where, so... Uh, well, so let me do it again, sorry. Please. The spanking business? Yep. There's been studies recently published in the American Journal, uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association's pediatrics publication. The kids who are spanked experience as much trauma as kids who are more severely abused. That's what the findings are in the long term. Sorry to interrupt, but I no, just be, yeah. not at all. Yeah. Uh, this topic is a incredibly meaningful for anybody considering having kids, raising kids. Yeah. Um, and certainly, even for me, somebody that doesn't have kids nor plan to have kids, it's it is 
the the thesis of your book is so big and so powerful mm. that it what it does though is it okay so i've grown up in a culture this your hypothesis i've grown up in a culture that is fundamentally sick yeah. is stopping um parent uh, many many things the book is way bigger than uh just parenting we just yeah. happen to be on that right now but um so it's created sort of parents that are detached from their parental instincts that's right and so they're constantly making these mistakes but it feels normal right so i grew up in it too the yeah. it, the fish is the last one to recognize what water is yeah um and so i can't even see that there could be another way of doing this right but because of that when i look at this i think once you're in the cycle how do you break out of it because a you can't be an infant forever even you know gorillas at some point like the, the child is distanced from the parents needs yes. to be either they break away themselves or they get pushed away or their parents may die also very possible yeah and in the cultures that i have unintentionally encountered rites of passage rituals because i'm interested in rites of passage yeah there's this moment, but I don't, so the one I'll talk to specifically because I remember it so vividly is in um, The Long Walk to Freedom, Nelson Mandela's book. He talks okay. about how, I think it was your 14th birthday, you're with the woman, and your mother, yeah. and then you are ceremoniously removed from her physically, like they come and grab you and take you away. At what age? Uh, I think it was 14. Okay and they take you away and then there is this, they cover you in mud mm -hmm. and then you are, actually I think before you get covered in mud, I'm getting the order wrong here, but anyway, they sit you down buck naked mm -hmm. in front of the whole tribe yeah. with a very sharp rock, they cut your foreskin off and they uh. make you yell a warrior prayer yeah. and then they cover you in mud and then another young woman comes in after some time, washes the mud off your body. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was this whole thing and before reading your work, I was like, that's so rad, like this rite of passage that's dope, you're taking the child away from the mother. Is that, is that a necessary moment? Or is that all part of this, like just sort of crazy detachment from what we should be doing? So I think it's a mix of both. Um, let's just step back a little bit. Um, nature has a natural agenda for every human being. Like when you plant an acorn, what's nature's agenda for that acorn? Grow into a tree. Grow up to be an oak tree. So nature has the same agenda for human beings, to grow up to be independent, self-mastered, um, collective, connected beings. That's nature's agenda. That's how we evolved. Mm. But that means if you meet the right developmental conditions, that kid will grow up to be an independent person. Not because you pushed them away, but because that's nature's agenda. Because the parents are gonna die at some point or another. So at some point or another, that infant has to be an independent adult. That's nature's agenda. We don't have to make that happen. That happens spontaneously so long as the conditions are right. Now, if you plant that acorn into dry ground with no irrigation and no sunlight, ain't gonna be any oak tree. Not because the acorn doesn't have that capacity, but because the conditions weren't right. Mm -hmm. Same with human beings. So I'm saying if the conditions are right, that independence will happen anyway. Now, it's true. Societies have developed rituals of passage. So there's a Jewish bar mitzvah ceremony which happens at age 13. You know, um, there's a vision quest that, that, that indigenous people will lead, you know, but those ritual rites of passages or those passage of rit rites of passage rituals are conducted by adults to welcome the child into the adult community. In the original, original environments, which is small band hunter or groups, there wasn't circumcision. In fact, I quote an expert on Aboriginal indigenous or hunter-gatherer groups, Dr. Donacia Narvez of Notre Dame University, who says that circumcision wasn't a part of that kind of practice. So that circumcision came along later with, 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 with more settled tribes and agriculture and so on. So once you get away from the hunter-gatherer, milieu we're getting more and more or less and less natural so what mandela is describing then is a combination of a healthy rite of passage of we're recognizing your adulthood now we're honoring you welcoming you to the community of adults but there was also an element of barbarism in it where you're deliberately hurting a child for which there's no reason whatsoever whether it's a male child or it's a female child 
and we know to what degree female children in some areas of the world are hurt by the rituals of uh, circumcision, the male children are hurt as well, not to the same degree as the females. But those are already post um, hunter-gatherer um, additions. So yes, r rite of passage, beautiful. Why is it necessary to hurt somebody? It's not. Hiding in there, and I'm so curious, I'm so glad that I get to ask you directly, hiding in there is a, sounds like to me a vision of humanity that is just loving and wonderful and that our natural state is um, we would grow into the oak tree. That doesn't, that isn't my same base assumption, but mm. you very much have an expertise that I lack. So does your worldview require that belief about humans to be not purely good, but certainly default good? No, nobody's default good. We've always had problems as human beings because we're flawed beings, you know? But it's a question again of um, what develops under what conditions, you know? And uh, the more our, our needs are met, the more, like for example, in this society, the belief very much is that we're competitive, aggressive, even hostile, selfish creatures. That's not how most of the, that's not how humanity developed. We could never have developed if that's the way we were. We could only have developed if they were nurturing and communal, communal support and connection. And so if you look at all kinds of cultures that are so-called um, primitive, so-called primitive, giving and receiving and connection are values. And people gain wealth by giving, not by gathering and taking from others. So wealth is defined as a set of social connections rather than a set of physical possessions. In Canada, in the Northwest, Pacific Northwest, they used to have the potlatch. And the potlatch were, do you know what a potlatch is? Yeah. Yeah, so it's an event where people gather and they give gifts, which is how they gather wealth of connections. That's a very different sense of wealth than gathering everything onto myself by taking it away from everybody else. One of the first things that the colonialists did is they forbade the rituals and the spiritual ways of the indigenous people, including the potlatch, because it threatened the colonialist acquisitive ethic. So we went against thousands of years of tradition in order to force people into a cultural mindset that suited the purpose of colonialism. And that's what happened. Right now, at the age that I'm at, it's more useful, it's more motivating to realize that I'm okay. going to die. Uh, when I was okay. saying I'm not rushing towards that, I, yeah. if I actually thought it w would work, I would cryogenically freeze myself. Like I would much prefer to live forever. Um, oh yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, mm -hmm. That's not even like a, a question for me. And that may be mental illness. I'm perfectly willing to accept that. But in terms of what is motivating to me, that for sure. Like one of my great pains, and this is one, it actually bothers me so much I can't allow myself to think about it. Um, that I can't pursue all the things that I'm passionate about because there just isn't enough time. <laughs> I know that one. And that's uh, like, that's one of those far more than stubbing my toe would make me think life is unfair. That one does. And it really messes with my head. And so I, I just have to put it out of my mind. Yeah, but it only messes with your head because you have a certain belief. I mean, there's a, the, 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 there's a belief underneath. I totally get it. I mean, I, th I think a lot of us have experienced that. I certainly have. Somebody once said, every choice excludes. Every time you make a choice, you're excluding something else. You know? And that's yes. certainly true. The, the question is, what part of me or you doesn't want to accept that? Why do we have a problem with it? And there's some underlying belief there that creates pain around it. It doesn't need to be painful. It's just going to be just, just reality. You know, but so if it hurts or if it bothers us, there's some belief there. I haven't thought about it, but now that you mention it, there's some belief there that creates the, the pain. It's just like, why do I have to be everything and do everything? Why? 
I am a limited human being. You know, I'll take a swag at it and let yeah. me know what you think. So um, part of what I do um, is, so my company actually tells stories. So movies, yeah. TV shows, comic books, that whole thing. Yeah. And when we're developing a project, we need to figure out what the style of that project, let's say it's a comic book. We have to figure out the style. Okay. So you go and you start, you know, looking at materials and seeing it and you realize that there's a hundred different ways you could go, 200 different ways, yeah. more. Yeah. And you'll respond so intensely to seven of them. Yeah. And it is very hard to know that I won't get to spend a year in that style, right? That I have to narrow it down to, to just one. And it's interesting. Like what I always tell entrepreneurs is what really trips people up is you're standing in a room with a thousand doors and your job is to close 999 of them, right? To decide comes from what the Latin to cut. It's like, to your point about exclusion, that there's going back to the physics of being human, I don't know why, and maybe it's a modern society thing, but humans have a hard time closing those doors. They have a much harder time of closing the other doors than they have walking through one. Because if I say, hey, you can walk through that one, you can come right back, then they'll walk through it. But if I say, you have to pick one that you were gonna walk through forever, that they would just stand there paralyzed. But isn't, don't we have the same dilemma when it comes to relationships as well? You know, it's interesting, when I was saying that, my wife popped into my mind and I don't with relationships. I have not struggled with that. Um, I, yeah. it was a part of the calculus of whether or not to marry my wife that I'll never sleep with another woman again. Um, yeah. but it wasn't a hard part of the calculus. So I don't know if that's just, uh, okay. My okay, that's how, or what? Fair enough. And that's great. And what about before you met your wife? Gabor, this is interesting. And uh, any insight you have here will be greatly welcomed. I understood very early on the utility of um, commitment. So mm -hmm. I was very bad with women when I was young, extraordinarily bad. Mm -hmm. And my mom, though, gave me a piece of advice, which was mind blowing to me. And she said, for a woman, trust is required for an orgasm. And I thought, mm -hmm. what? Like yeah. that seems so strange to me as a guy. I was like, let me tell you that trust does not enter into my mind when it comes to whether or not I can have an orgasm. Yeah. And, but I thought, Ooh, that's really interesting. And so then sort of looking at women, how they're prized for their beauty and committing to somebody, which always struck me as a good idea that the value in a shared life, like if you ever watch this interview over again, look at my face when you say you've been married for 51 years, I, I was smiling ear to ear mm -hmm. um, because that's something that really matters to me is sharing a life with my wife for as long as humanly possible. And all the things that I have to give up pale in comparison to what it means to share a life with somebody like that. Um, so putting the, okay, women need trust. That's interesting. They're prized for their beauty, which means that it's going to go away over time as their partner wanting to give them that love and security and, and, and to be seen and desired, which I think is um, something that people long for in a romantic relationship. I need my wife to know that I will always find other women attractive because it's just hardwired in me, but I so covet commitment and, and being in a bonded relationship with you that I want you to know, no matter what, you're going to turn into a bag of wrinkles. God willing, we get to that stage. You're old. I'm old. We're not physically attractive in the, the typical, you know, cues of beauty and fertility, but I'm still going to be into you because we've shared a life. So anyway, that notion hit me very early. And so I've always, I haven't struggled with commitment. I guess that was oh, a lot of words yeah. around that. And I, and I have been a commitment phobe, you know, really, which has what, to do what was the push? Well, which has to do with my own childhood history, you know, is that to commit something is to invite pain and rejection, you know, which goes back to, being one year old and being given to a stranger by my mother to save my life. And I didn't see her for six weeks, five or six weeks. So to be, to open your heart and to be committed means to be hurt. You know, I'm not making excuses. I'm saying that's how it worked for me. I've learned commitment. So I, 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 your, your mother gave you beautiful advice, but I've had to learn that over time. The good news I can tell you 
Satan is the beauty does not go away. That, that, that should your marriage come to 51 years, as mine has, you'll be looking into your wife's eyes and you'll be, looking the, you'll be seeing the same beauty that you saw the first day you met her. It's going to be amazing. So it's not like that. It's not like all those wrinkles and stuff. They don't take away the beauty. That's not where the beauty comes from. You know, so that, 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 that again is our society's um, travesty when it comes to defining beauty. Um, so I'm telling you, I got good news for you. <laughs> no, I love that. Um, I know you're uh, very clear about the things you consider yourself an expert in and what you don't, and I'm more than happy to hear just your thoughts out loud. But I'm curious, in 51 years of marriage, other than that that beauty remains, um, what are things that you've learned? It seems like your marriage is better now than it was before based on things I've heard you say before. Um, what, what advice do you have for people that are you know, much earlier in a relationship than you? Um. It's that the marriage is um, a wonderful opportunity to learn about yourself and about life if you're willing to be curious. <clears throat> and, um, and that it's not 50-50. It's 100%. It's 100%. So you're each 100% responsible for how you show up. And every difficulty we've ever had has been a powerful learning experience. And this is where the commitment to truth comes in because that's one thing we've shared is that it's not easy to give up your point of view and your grievance and your stance, but there's a deep payoff in, when you do that so that the marriage is just the, the most wonderful school there is for development. If you're willing to look at it like that, and if if you and if when you need the help, if you're willing to get the help to look at it that way. And so, how do you open yourself up to that? Is it soliciting feedback from? your partner about what they see and how you are and helping you understand the truth about yourself or is it something totally different? Well, there's a lot, there's, there's certainly that, that's a big, important part of it. Um, it's also, which goes back to a lot of my work is that any deep pain that you're experiencing is you confusing the present moment for the past. So that in a marriage, you're gonna get triggered. But when you think of a trigger, it's a very small little thing. And what's much more important is the ammunition and the explosive that the trigger sets off. And guess what? Who's carrying the ammunition, the explosive? You are. So you can focus on the trigger. She said this, or he said that, or they didn't say that, they didn't do that. Or you can focus on, oh, what's exploding inside me and how long have I been carrying this? So it takes that curiosity and that willingness to look at yourself. Speaking of trauma and how we're carrying around that explosive charge, are there universals to healing from trauma? What do you mean universals? Things that apply to everybody. So um, I'm guessing a big part of it's going to be self-awareness. You need to become self-aware. Um, but when I think about adults trying to heal from childhood trauma, that strikes me as a very difficult road. And I'm just wondering, um, you know, I, I hope that it's a hopeful road. Certainly from what I've encountered with your work, there's definitely a lot of hope. Um, and I'm just curious, you know, for somebody watching this, who's, who is just in the grips of, you know, childhood traumas, both sort of known and unconscious, um, what can they do to begin to heal? So there's many healing paths, but my own approach can be summed up in two words. And it's also the title of a course that I teach for therapists and so on. Um, and there's versions of it for the lay public as well. I'm not recommending my particular work. I'm talking about the name, Compassionate Inquiry. 
So if you can be curious, the inquiry part is the curiosity part. I reacted that way. Oh, why did I react that way? Not why did I react that way? That's not compassionate. I reacted that way. I felt this pain. I felt overwhelmed. I felt hatred. I felt rage. I felt despair. Huh. What is that about? So you have to have that curiosity. And you have to have the compassion to look at yourself, not through that voice that tells you that you're worthless, but to say, if I reacted that way, there must be a good reason for it. Something in me, there's something happened to me that made me react that way at some point. So to be, so rather than putting oneself down or thinking that if I have problems, it means I'm deficient, I have the curiosity to look into it and the compassion to not to judge yourself for it. And that both can be learned, both the curiosity and the compassion can be learned. And any good therapist, any, any person you work with, whether they call it compassion or inquiry, whether they call it something else, whatever they work with, those two attitudes will be embedded in their approach if they're gonna be helpful to you. So compassion curiosity, I think is the key. And then are there tools, so let's say that somebody's doing the passionate inquiry, they really begin to understand what happened to them. In fact, maybe this is a better question. So let's say that you had had the upbringing that you had, all the things you went through in Hungary in your infancy, but no one ever told you about it. What does somebody who they clearly are suffering from some sort of trauma, um, but they, they don't know what it is, how can they process through that? Oh, yeah, uh, that's not very difficult because it shows up in the present. And I can easily, I do that with people all the time. So, so they don't need the why, they just need to know that they are reacting that way. Well, it, it's not difficult to get them to see um, that what they think is a reaction to the present is actually a reaction to the past. This is without any recall because there's all kinds of memory and the body carries memory even if it doesn't carry recall. And a lot of the things that people that have happened to people happened before they had conscious recall. So uh, in my work, I don't find it difficult to drill down to what is it that people are carrying in the present, you know, and I, it's just a simple exercise that I do with people. Uh, so that what I'm saying, but, but to make it long story short, the past shows up in the present all the time. And that goes back to Johnny Cash. It all goes down in your mind. You think you're reacting to something now? Uh, no, you're not. You know, the, uh, there's a wonderful um, um, Italian writer who a survivor of the Holocaust called Primo Levi, who's just the most profound writer on the Holocaust of them all. And he wow. went through Auschwitz, he survived, ended up committing suicide decades later. Um, but he said, uh, I'm just um, looking for the precise code here on my cell phone. If I can find it, I will uh, give it to you, if you can bear with me, pre... I mean, the, the setup here, I'm more than happy to wait. Okay, I'm, Primo. I'm holding my breath. Levy. Okay, here it is. So he says, um, anguish is known to everyone, even children. And everyone knows that it is even blank and undifferentiated. Rarely does it carry a clearly written label that also contains its motivation. In other words, people are beyond all suffering, but we don't always know what it's about. Mm. He says, and any label that it does carry can be mendacious. In other words, we can tell ourselves that we're suffering because of this, but it's not necessarily true. He says, one can believe, this is the heart of it, one can believe or declare oneself to be anguished for one reason and be so for something totally different. 
one can think that one is suffering at facing the future and instead be suffering because of one's past. One can think that one is suffering for others out of pity, out of compassion, and instead be suffering for one's own reasons, and so on and so on. And I just don't find it that difficult to speak to somebody and show them that their present suffering is actually a memory of past suffering. So that, you know, so recall is helpful and, you know, there's ways to get at it. Sometimes if, if it's totally inaccessible, people do hypnosis sometimes, people do EMDR sometimes, people do... What's EMDR? Uh, I've heard you mention that before, but I don't know um, what it is. Eye movement desensitization reprogramming. It's mm -hmm. a way of working with conscious and unconscious memories. Um, there's psychedelic work that sometimes I've seen people under the influence of psychedelics recall things um, that are not available to conscious memory usually, but none of that is crucial. What is crucial is to make the distinction that what I'm experiencing now is a resonance of the past. We want a totally different outcome. So we're not going to be judging just based on your math. We're going to be looking at inquisitiveness. We're going to be yeah. looking at how yeah. much that you want to learn, but you're dealing with large groups, people in all different kinds of positions. Like how do we, cause the, there, the punchline of your book is like basically, Hey, we're going to have to overhaul a lot of this. Yeah. I mean, you go very specifically into the ways in which the culture is toxic. You have to read the book to get into it. Um, but it is like in a nutshell is basically we're sort of like, this is a ground up restart. Like there is a fundamental flaw. We've already talked about the sort of basic, basic first building block yeah. of how you actually, in fact, we haven't. Cause in the book you talk about like, even before you get pregnant, the things that can <laughs> create trauma in yeah. a yeah. fetus and it's carried on. And look, I, I will tell you dear audience that uh, he talks about the science and there really is from what I've seen quite a bit of science that can show, I think it was up to five generations, you could see an epigenetic marker of trauma yeah. in even the father who's carrying that across the yeah. sperm into yeah. the fertilized egg. Yeah. It has yeah. an impact on how the DNA is wrapped and expressed. It's insane and that it goes for five generations. That's yeah. madness and you yeah. begin to realize how easy it is to perpetuate yeah. this sort of wheel of trauma. Yeah. So knowing that, there's probably two things we should talk about because mm -hmm. right now if mothers are paying attention, they're freaking out about all the mistakes that they made that have now traumatized their children. Uh, and so you go into blame in the book. I think that's important to touch on. Uh, and then- Yeah, go into the importance of not blaming. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So I want you to yeah. speak to the role of blame here. Yeah. Um, and then how do we begin to heal, stroke, build a society that isn't sick? Well, the good news is that I wrote this book with my eldest son. I mean, and believe me, I've had a lot of guilt as a parent. I felt a lot of guilt for the way that I stressed and, and, and passed on my own trauma to my children, which I did. Not because I wanted to, I loved them. I, I, as I've always said, I would have thrown myself into a fire for them, but there was a problem. They never needed me to throw myself into a fire. They just needed me to be at home, self-regulated, mm. knowing how to take care of myself, and being knowing how to attune with their needs. Now that, as a traumatized survivor of the genocide in Europe, and as a workaholic doctor, and as an anxious husband, in a conflictual marriage, uh, I wasn't able to do. And that really did hurt my kids. I say that at this point, not with guilt, just to say that's what happened. Mm -hmm. I know I did my best. That just happened to be my best. But anyway, now what I'm saying is, is that um, I wrote this book with my son, and even the writing was a process of working out our issues. So the first thing, though, is that these issues can always be worked out. The, 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 the patterns can be reversed. We don't have to get stay stuck in them. Mm. So that's the good news. As far as blame is concerned, um, as you say, trauma is passed on multi-generationally. You know, the Bible says that uh, the sins of the fathers will be visited on to the third and fourth generations. They're not talking about the sins of the fathers. They're talking about the traumas of the parents mm. will be passed on to the future generations. It's true. Um, but if that's true, 
um, if I passed on my trauma to my kid, my trauma to my kids, did I cause my own trauma as a child? Why would anybody be blamed? You end up, who you end up blaming? Adam and Eve? You know, you end up blaming some ape living in a tree who was my ancestor at some point. I mean, blame doesn't make any sense. It's also cruel and, 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 and totally unhelpful. So there's no blame. In fact, it's, it's, about under, it's not about blaming, it's about understanding. But once we understand, now we can start to do th things differently. And that's the whole point. It's not about blaming. So we have to break the cycle, self-awareness, yeah. yeah. get in touch with ourselves. Now let's zoom out a little bit. So we know what to do on an individual basis. We have to stop the repression, let the emotions come up, mature yeah. into the adult that has the ability to self-regulate that could be there for the next generation to raise a child in a healthier way. Exactly. At a societal level, how do we begin to think about this? And what are some highlights of like the, the things that you're like, yo, this is really broken and causing a lot of problems. Is it the healthcare system? Is it the education system? Like where do you think sort of the, the real big ones are? Well, the healthcare system and educational system, um, in any given society, the dominant institutions will reflect the interests of the dominant groups in any society. So who are the dominant groups in this society? Here's what we know. I know I'm talking to somebody who's made a lot of money, okay? So don't take this personally. <laughs> but but uh, the dominant groups in this society are getting wealthier and wealthier and wealthier, and the rest of society is getting more and more uncertain and insecure. That's an untenable situation. Because when you look at what stresses people are loss of control, uncertainty, conflict and lack of information, which are precisely the conditions that most people are increasingly living with. There's less security, there's less sense of a positive future, there's more sense of loss of control, there's more sense that I, I'm a little voice, I don't matter. Even during COVID, when uh, a lot of people lost a lot of money and under terif terrific uh, economic stress, the top stratum of billionaires gained immensely. Well, that's a stressful situation for a lot of people. That stress translates into physiological illness. That's just how it works. That's the first point. Uncertainty, loss of control, conflict, lack of information. That's a given condition of globalized capitalism. Because you never know wh when somebody a zillion miles away is gonna make a decision that's gonna change your life completely over which you have no control whatsoever. That's a designation, or well, that's a, a recipe for stress, mm. okay? Number one. Number two, um, you look at, well, there's a chapter on socio sociopathy as strategy. Now, you look at corporations major corporations who make decisions to deliberately concoct products that'll get people hooked and addicted. I'm talking about the food companies. This has been documented, that they actually plan scientifically which combination of salt, sugar, and fat are gonna get people addicted, which are gonna excite the addictive circuits in the brain. No doubt. Thereby killing millions of people. The tobacco companies, do I have to talk about them at all? About, about what they've done? The companies that have for decades hired phony scientists to deny climate change, thereby creating conditions of ill health, endangering life itself. And these are respectable, well-to-do um, pillars of society and philanthropists on massive scale. Um, the pharmaceutical companies, the pharmaceutical companies who sell opiates knowing. Now, I'm not against opiates, by the way. As a palliative care doctor, I love the opiates, not mm -hmm. for myself, but for the patients I was looking after. Thank God. But 
to sell those products and telling doctors that they're not addictive when, they, when you know that they are. Mm -hmm. Tens and hundreds of thousands of people are dying of, of opioid overdoses. But that's sociopathy by any definition. And these are the people at the top. Still an echo of childhood trauma, or do you think there's something else at play? Well, uh, it's a combination. I, I think the people who do it, they're really disconnected from themselves. They really are disconnected from themselves. Uh, and they're acting out their traumas in some ways. But it's also the nature of this system. These are the people that this system raises to high levels of power and rewards. Then there's the political system. Now, I'm not talking about political policy here for a moment, but in the book, in the, in the, in the chapter on trauma and politics, we looked at two opposing candidates, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. Now, Trump is, a, is one of the world's trauma experts. Bessel van der Kolk said to me, is a poster boy for, for trauma. The grandiosity, the denial of reality, the genuine inability to tell reality from lies, um, the aggressiveness. Trump said once that, um, that the world is a horrible place. It's dog eat dog. Even your friends want your wife, they want your money, they want your house. And this is your friends. Now, he wasn't making it up. That sense of the world being a horrible place reflected his childhood mm -hmm. under a tyrant of a father who demeaned his kids horribly and a mother who didn't protect them. And one of his brothers drank himself to death. Now, as we know, his niece wrote a book who knows the family really well on the, Trump that, on the trauma that Trump endured and how it manifests in his adult life. Now. I'm not criticizing the guy, I'm not blaming him, I'm not even talking about his specific policies, I'm talking about his personality. Now, that's Trump, okay? Who was he running against? So, let me tell you this story. I, I, you probably read it, but let me tell it to you and give me your opinion. A four-year-old girl runs into the house to his mother. She's upset because neighborhood kids are bullying, neighborhood children are bullying her. And the mother says, there's no room for cards in this house. Now you get out there and deal with it. What's the message to that child? At four years old. Yeah. God, at four years old, how would that be read? That you're on your own, kid. Yeah, you suck it up. And don't be vulnerable in this house. That story was told at Hillary Clinton's nomination celebration at the Democratic um, convention in 2016 and it was told as an example of wonderful parenting mm. that same election campaign when Hillary developed pneumonia what did she do with it do you remember nothing right she didn't tell anybody yeah. she collapsed in the street she sucked it up and she put up of course with the philandering of her husband all those years blaming herself for not meeting his needs Typical trauma response. What I'm saying is that the American public had the choice of being two traumatized people. They chose the more traumatized one. <laughs> the more traumatized. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. That's that's the one. They, that's the one they chose. There are all kinds of reasons for that. Again, I'm not talking about policy, foreign or domestic. I'm talking about personalities here. Mm -hmm. These are the people that we elevate to public, uh, high public level and they carry their traumas with them. Inevitably, those traumas show up in their politics. Mm. Okay, so society, healing, making things better. I know that you consider yourself hopeful, as do I. I am worried. Mm -hmm. uh, we were talking about this before we started yeah. recording. Yeah. There is, uh, my audience is gonna get tired of hearing me say this, but there is a Chinese, uh, Curse, proverb, not May sure. you live in interesting which, times. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I would say right about now. It's very uh, interesting. Very interesting times. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. how do we, and I think you've even said that it, you know, there's going to be a period of, of deep unpleasantness, but uh, that long term you're optimistic and walk me through one is, 
why are you optimistic? I am too, but I'm just curious what drives your optimism? And then how do we make sure we end up on the optimistic side? Well, look, the, first of all, to speak personally, um, the imprint on me of um, being an infant under conditions of genocide and war and under conditions of a mother who was really stressed and terrorized um, and grief struck because her parents were killed in Auschwitz. Oh, God. Uh, and then who gives me up to a total stranger when I'm a year old to save my life. I remember that story. Yeah. Was that this is a bad world, that I'm on my own, that um, nothing's ever going to work out for me. And so even when I was successful as a physician and even as a writer and so on, my innate belief was I'm basically screwed. Now, I don't feel that way anymore. So, Do you I, remember when that changed? Like, I, I'm trying to figure out when that changed. So what was the work that you were doing? Because we have the, the thumbnail sketch. Yeah. We understand we have to stop repressing our emotions, let them yeah. get reattached to ourselves. Yeah. But like, if it were that easy, then everybody would be cured at the end of this podcast, which of course they won't yeah, be. It's not that easy, no. So in the work that you were doing on yourself, were there a string of breakthroughs? There were a string of breakthroughs. It wasn't like one big epiphany. Mm. It was the gradual work over time. Do you remember any of the, the key moments? A lot of it happened in my relationship. Uh, I'm married to somebody who, uh, in my first chapter, I say that, you know, my problem is that my wife understands me, you know, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> she does all too well. But she loved me anyway. So, and, and wanting to be in that relationship, I had to grow up. Because at a certain point, she wasn't willing to live with the child anymore. Mm. So we grew together. Uh, I would say that was the basic ground of my development. But getting therapy, learning to know my own patterns and where they came from and learning to get some agency over them was very important for me. Uh, what I observed as a physician, as a clinician, as a healer, was huge fonts of information for me. And learning what because you start to understand the patterns of human behavior? Yeah, I started to understand human beings. Um, uh, sometimes I took antidepressants. Uh, that helped temporarily. By lifting the cloud, letting lifting you feel the something so different. I could, so I could feel more clearly. In fact, you know, again, I'm not an advocate for the massive and I think horrendously overdone use of mm -hmm. medications. But I can tell you. That the first time I took antidepressant, after a few days, I said, you mean people can feel like this normally? Mm -hmm. So when that cloud is lifted, I could see a bit more clearly now, a lot more clearly, actually. Um, coming to terms with my ADHD and understanding the patterns, not as an inherited disease, but as an adaptive response, mm. uh, really helped as well. Um, Ooh, interesting. So wait. Oh, I'm not surprised. So everything comes back to trauma. So mm -hmm. how is ADHD an adaptive response to a situation? Okay. So picture me, okay, as I was at the uh, first year of my life. Mm -hmm. um, my father's in forced labor. My mother doesn't know if he's dead or alive. Her parents are killed in Auschwitz when I'm five months of age. She has to wear the yellow badge as a Jew under the Nazis. That painting of that is going to be in the book. Um, uh, she's terrorized. She doesn't know if she's going to survive, if mm -hmm. I'm going to survive. How am I feeling? I can only imagine. Well, give me a few words. Um, afraid. Yeah. Lost. There's a pediatrician that saw me and said he has never seen such fear in anybody's eyes than in my own eyes. Lost. Right. All that. Hopeless, stressed. Okay. Very. How do I cope with that? You push it down. I dissociate. I tune out. What is it ADD all about? Tuning out. Really? Never that, thought of it like that. Well, ADD, the major trait of ADD is tuning out, a kind of absent mindedness, mm. an unwilled tuning out. As an infant, what else could I do? Could I escape? Could I change the situation? I tune out. When am I tuning out? When my brain is developing. The tuning out gets programmed to my brain. Why are we seeing more and more kids with ADHD these days? Because parents are so stressed. Mm. And sensitive kids pick up on that stress 
They don't know what to do with it. They tune out as, as small children when their brains are developing. It's not a genetic disease. It's an adaptive response. The problem with adaptive responses is they help you at the time, but later on they become problems. In other words, adaptive at one point, maladaptive at another mm-hmm. point. Again, the problem is that they're not conscious adaptations. I mean, look, if, you, it, was, if it was raining, in California, the weather's always good in Los Angeles, but let's go back to Canada, okay? It's, um, I'm up in the north of Canada, it's freezing, it's, you know, 50 below, whatever that even means, you know? How do I adapt? I put on warm clothing. That helps me survive. But what if I still wore that warm clothing in the wintertime when it's really hot? That same adaptation would not kill me. Mm. The problem with these childhood adaptations, now with the cold clothing, I could take it off. Oh, it's not cold anymore. I can take off the warm clothing. These childhood psychological uh, adaptations, they're not conscious. They're not willed. They're not deliberate. They're automatic. They're under the level of awareness. Therefore, I can't just drop them. In fact, I even associate my survival with them. So I'm very reluctant to give them up. So something has to happen to wake me up. Oh, this isn't working anymore. This is where a diagnosis like ADHD or depression comes in. This is where illness comes in. It can be a wake up call. Again, I don't recommend it. Or a relation, or a bad divorce. All of a sudden you realize, I married somebody who didn't understand me. Why did I stay with them so long? Because my parents never understood me. So I expect not to be understood. Mm. But it doesn't work for me anymore. So next time I marry, I'm going to marry somebody who is a bit more mature. And, and, you know, I'm more mature now. So what I'm saying is that these adaptations, they show up as problems later on in life. And then we can learn from them. In, In the case of my marriage, we learn together. I'm curious, in, in a marriage, so parents should offer their kids unconditional love. Yeah. Should a spouse offer their other half unconditional love? Yes, but it shows up differently. So unconditional love doesn't mean that I have to put up with it. Doesn't mean that, uh, you know, in, 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 the case of, uh, in the case of my wife, when I'm throwing a tantrum, the healthy response on her part is to say, if you're going to be like that, I don't want to be in the same room with you. In fact, if you keep doing it, I don't even want to be in the same house with you. So what is it that changes between childhood and adulthood? Because in childhood, you're saying don't do that. The dependency. The dependency. That, That the child depends on the parent for very life itself mm. and for healthy development. My wife is not responsible for my healthy development. She's not my mother anymore. As a matter of fact, the reason women get so much autoimmune disease is they suppress themselves to take care of the stresses of their men very often. Yeah, you tell a story. I think it's in the book. I've heard so many interviews as well. Sometimes I get confused what was in the book uh, of a woman who's diagnosed with breast cancer and her husband whose first wife had also died of breast cancer, her first thought was, oh my God, I hope I don't get so sick that I can't take care of it. Yeah, it's in the book. Her immediate, she's the one that diagnosed with breast cancer. She's gonna have the chemotherapy or radiation or surgery or whatever. And her first thought is, how will I look after my husband's emotional needs? Mm. Well, that's culturally ingrained in women. That's why they Do you think it's just cultural or is it also an echo of the need to be nurturing to the child? It's true that the nurturing instinct in women is much more mm, developed than in men, partly because they have more of the hormone oxytocin, which is a nurturing hormone, but partly because it's their cultural role. And if you take men who look after children, they become really good mothers. So it's a question of what role pe- are people put in. Mm. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, I forgot what we were talking about. Right before that last saying, yeah. you were explaining the difference between um, the dependencies of a yeah. child. Here, here, here's a, oh yeah, my wife is not responsible to help me go into a healthy adult. That's not her job. Mm. Her job is to be responsible for the healthy growth of our children. 
if she suppresses her needs and puts all her energy in taking care of the women have a decision to make in our society my wife did really in a sense uh, am I going to look after the little babies or am I going to look after the big baby and the energy they put into looking after the big baby is taken away from the little babies mm -hmm. and children suffer as a result so my wife is not responsible for my maturation and my healthy growth um, she, ex she has the right to expect that I'm going to show up as an adult but when you're supposed to offer unconditional love and you're not getting what you need from your significant other, how do you have people play that out? Is it is there a point at which they say, look, I just I can't offer you unconditional love. I need to separate from this. Or well, you can say, I love you. I really want the best for you, but I can't be with this. Mm. I can't be with it. It's toxic for me. It's bad for our children some point that's a reason so in that say. way do are you saying that we should have unconditional love for everybody even though that means we'll maintain boundaries we'll have different kinds of well, relationships it depends what we mean by unconditional love and again it depends on the age of the person and the the needs of that person so um uh having love for a person doesn't mean that you're going to put up with everything that they do mm -hmm. but how you like even with children, as we said earlier, we have to draw our boundaries. But the question is how do we draw our boundaries? And in what spirit and with what intention? That's interesting. That's so complicated and makes me despair because it's so hard, but I think you're right. The spirit in which you make the intention. So for instance, my wife and I, yeah. I would never have said that I love her unconditionally just because mm. that doesn't feel true in that I have specifically given her conditions and said, um, if you were unfaithful to me, that would be the end of the marriage. Yes. Um, that would be the end of my marriage too. For sure. Yeah. So, but the spirit in which I make that is not meant to be a threat or anything like that. No. It's just clarity. What you're actually saying is, honey, my relationship with you is so important that I can't bear to share that with somebody else on that intimate basis. Because my capacity to be intimate with you would really suffer mm. if I had to wonder whether you're choosing somebody else instead of me. That's a perfectly normal, healthy statement to make to an adult partner. It's an expression of love, actually. Help me understand that. Well, How is that an expression of love? Because you really want her. You're helping them be successful. You really, want that, you really want that person in your life. You're saying, I really want you in my life, fully. And there's no room for that in that. You can have all kinds of friends, and I hope you're independent, and you have a life that's not all bound up with my own, and I want you to have your own activities and find your own meaning and have your own friends and have your own activities. But in terms of inter intimate relationships, I can't handle sharing that with somebody else. Mm. That's an expression of love. There's so much depth and nuance to the human mind, to the human experience. Yeah. Do you at all worry that we as a society will not be that? Here's my thesis. We didn't intentionally get it right a thousand years ago or yeah. 10,000 years yeah. ago. Yeah. It was just that was the nature of what we had access to. That's right. And to sort of co opt Chris Rock's statement, you're only as faithful as your options, which I totally disagree with. But, <laughs> uh, but culturally, like when you take it en masse, it does feel like a lot of the sort of sickness things are us solving like these minor annoyances that end up snowballing into becoming deep problems like at first it's just like hey we want to be able to control the food supply so we don't starve to death amazing but then it's like well we can already do that now i want to make sure that the food that i'm storing tastes good and then it's like whoa well if i can do that then i want to be able to sell it and if i want to sell it i want to sell more of it now that i want to sell more of it i want to make sure that it tastes really good and gets into that addictive quality that you're talking about and look not everybody does it obviously from a food perspective that was the whole reason that my partners and i got into food in the first place was we wanted to make junk food good for you. And so using things so that- I, I, I explain that, how do you mean junk food good for you? So if it's good for you, it's not junk food. 
Well, so to your point, this depends on how we define junk food. So yeah, yeah. I'll define the way that we looked at it yeah. is things that you grew up as like craving, wanting, yeah. whether it was chips. So we made yeah. protein chips. Now, yeah. the great thing about protein chips yeah. is they naturally kill your hunger. So yeah. you're only going to eat so many of them and then they stop being fun. Yeah. So doing things like that. But anyway, I don't want to get lost in that. But so I worry that that this isn't. A bell that can't be unrung. Well, well but, but let's go back to what we were talking about intention. Your intention wasn't purely to make a profit. Your intention was also to serve people while making a profit. That's a very different intention than my, my, own, than my only purpose is to make a lot of money at no matter what cost. No matter how many people get sick, how many people develop diabetes, become obese, become addicted to, to, to stuff that's terrible for them. That's the actual intention of many of the major corporations. Now that wasn't your intention. So I'm talking about intention. But how do we scale that? That's my punchline. How do we scale it? What do you mean by that? So I really, I, I have, I could have retired and never worked again, but yeah. I really want to help people like okay. get to, I wouldn't use your language. The word I always use is, is a growth mindset. I want people to have a growth mindset. Okay. But I think secretly we sort of have a very similar aim, which is we want people to thrive. We just happen to be each attacking a different part so of the So that's problem. the intention. The intention is that people should thrive. Now, how do we scale that? How do we get I, 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 You know what? I'm not a business person. What do you mean by scale? How do oh, we get sorry. It? I don't mean I, it from I, a business on a, on a, perspective. On a, on a massive level? Yeah. Yeah. So if we have a sick society, which I'm with you, or a sick culture, yeah. I'm with you, how do we, how do we get a culture like... I mean, we're recording this as there is a war going on on the borders of Europe. So yeah, yeah. Uh, it does make me feel like there's just a nature to humans and it repeats. I think we're going to have to challenge who's in control, for one thing. At some point, we're going to have to challenge that on some level. This is not a book about we, talk to, do, we do touch upon politics and the trauma that's manifested in politics. But this I is, hope the answer isn't politics. I hope the answer but, is... But, but, but this book is not a political manifesto. Agreed. You know? Um, but I think people have to start thinking about what I'm talking about on, on a large scale rather than just how do I make my life better? How do we make society better? In other words, how can we think with the mutual need as our intention and our commonality as intention rather than just my personal uh, you know, aggrandizement? I think that shift is going to have to happen for survival, number one. In terms of what you say about wars and so on, well, in any war, if you examine them closely, including this one, there are always conflicting interests and power interests and so on. I don't think I'd want to get into the politics of this war and what I think about it, but it's not just an expression of human nature. It's an expression of political systems clashing with each other for very selfish reasons. That's what I see happening, and I see that in just about every war. You know, so is it in our nature to be aggressive and cruel? Certainly our potential to be that way. But you know, here's what I see. Yesterday I was talking to a, a, a U.S. veteran, a Navy SEAL, who, who came back, as many do, with severe post-traumatic stress disorder. And uh, through a psychedelic experience, actually, he turned it around. He was losing his marriage. He was he was throwing coffee pots through the window. He Whoa. was terrifying his children. His wife no longer recognized him. And uh, then he had this experience, and he rediscovered his true nature, which was loving and, and, and nurturing and so on. And now he's that way towards the world. He would never go back and do the things again that he did then. Mm. You know? So th I even during COVID, you say human nature. Well, in the book I make this point, Alfie Cohn, who's an educator, educator and a writer, he says, when somebody behaves selfishly, we say, well, that's just human nature. How about when somebody behaves generously? We never say, well, that's just human nature, but it is. And, and so, at least in the early days of COVID, the more stressed we got and the more overwhelmed we got by the crisis, the more the divisions and the mm -hmm. rancor showed up in so many, on both sides. But what did we see in the beginning? We saw a lot of people cooperating, collaborating, being kind to each other, um, 
being communal, celebrating the healthcare workers, you know, supporting one another. That that's in our potential as well. So why should we settle for the worst versions of ourselves? And I say that's us. It isn't. Actually most people want peace. They don't want war. People usually have to be manipulated into war, which they are very often. Mm. You know, so What's our nature? That's why I'm optimistic. I think it's in us. What do you think social media is? It's an engine of envy. It's making you continually aware of what other people have and what you don't have. Look at my poor pitiful life. Well, that person who's, they're only posting the most positive things. Yeah. They're not showing their, their kind of unhappy, their misery of their daily life. 